Oh, hello world. I'm your host, Adam and Mike, and on this episode of the podcast, we are going to talk about what is AI consciousness and human nature. Today's guest is Graham Moorhead. Graham is a machine learning expert, author, and seasoned TEDx speaker. His holistic thought leadership is beyond reproach. As a Gonzaga University professor, he teaches complex concepts to the AI creators of the future. Graham has had a fascinating life and is very well traveled and some of these topics covered may not be for the faint of heart so listener discretion is advised regardless. I am highly confident at the end of this period of instruction you will be able to take what you have learned and apply it to your self awareness and that is called value and because of that you should like this video. Remember that sharing is caring. Be sure to check out all of Graham's information in the video description below. Please leave comments because they improve ranking and add prominence. Subscribing is what winners do, but smashing the bell is what legends do. This channel breeds legends. But first, AI news. IBM has developed the North Pole processor chip, a brain-inspired computer chip that can significantly enhance AI by working faster and with lower power consumption. It's a fancy video card. Unlike conventional chips, North Pole integrates computing and memory on a large scale, eliminating the need to frequently access external memory per neural layer, which is a bottleneck in many neural net systems. The, the chip boasts 256 cores, each with its own memory, and uses a unique network inspired by white matter connections in the human cerebral cortex. North Pole outperforms existing AI chips in image recognition and uses just one-fifth of the energy. While not suitable for large language models, North Pole could find applications in areas like self-driving cars. One drawback is that the video card comes with a pre-trained neural net, so you can't add new data to the training set or engineer data in any way. Graham Moorhead, everybody. Graham, tell the world about you. I'm from Boston originally. My dad was Air Force, so we actually got stationed in England for a while. I, was, I had a British accent as a kid. Cool. Came back to Boston, and I did the rest of my growing up there. Went to college there. Went, I studied physics at Boston University and in Madrid, Spain. And in my last semester... I realized I'm only going to be a mediocre physicist, but I took an AI course and I loved it. And it felt like this is sci-fi. How can this be a real job? And it turns out it is. And that's what I've been trying to do ever since. Now I moved to Spokane 2019. I love it here. I started teaching at Gonzaga not too long after that. I love teaching. Teaching is something I can do until I roll over dead into my grave. So it's something I get to enjoy doing. And now I also started writing books. I wrote a book recently called The Shape of Thought. And I got to do a talk about it that you were at. And I get to launch startups through Pangeon.com. Pangeon is my AI startup factory. Cool. So how to be an AI startup founder. That would be a good title. Yeah, too many people write about that, though. I'd rather write about consciousness or figure out peace in the world and things like that. You have served. Uh, do your, does your audience know all about that? If they've listened, yeah, I've, I've talked about that. Uh, certain stories, I haven't told like the whole thing. but we can Where else have you been besides Iraq and Afghanistan? I have been to Thailand, Singapore, the United Arab Emirates, um, a little place in the Philippines passing through. I've also been to Australia. I trained in the Outback. I've been to Kuwait. Yeah, I think that's it for countries. And I don't count airports. You don't count airports. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, so I've been to a bunch of places too. But let's talk about the Middle East specifically. Okay. Um, I've been to, um, let's see, 
Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Palestine, the West Bank, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Oman, UAE. And it is an area of the world that's very perplexing. And it's in the news again. That's mm -hmm. why I thought we could talk about it, because we both have some experience there. Mm -hmm. What's the solution? Mm. Yeah. So I can start from what I've seen, which is the Middle East has a massive... Uh, well, they believe in this thing called compulsory service. And people don't think of those secondary and tertiary effects of compulsory service. So all out through, throughout the Middle East, you had um, people in Egypt. They have compulsory service. Saddam had it. Like, you're going to join the military, and you're going to be taught how to fight. And so that's how... And I did this entire class at Gonzaga once. It was called Religion and Violence. And it, it was ISIS was going on at the time. And so... And they still are a thing. And and people, you know, they come up with their ideas. And But uh, what I've seen is when you have an economy, in a downed economy, and you have a bunch of young military-age males with that only have military experience and they have no job they're going to go back to what they know i mean you can't just jump into a into a russian t-72 tank and just start driving it they aren't user friendly you have to go to a school you have to learn how to do how do you think like able to organize so well i mean you can see what just regular shitheads on the street will organize and do and that's what they did in seattle and they can't really take or hold anything you know, mm -hmm. or organize. Oh, I remember that. that. Yeah. Yeah. When a part of Seattle yeah. was taken over by who knows who. Yeah. They weren't military. If they had any sort of training at all, they would have been more organized. But no, the, uh, but yeah, that's how they're able. So you have a big industry of fighters and they're coming from all over. They came like ISIS. They came from North Africa. They came from all over the world. And it's not hard to recruit them. Now, here's another problem you have is when you have a bunch of young um, men that romanticize war, they want to fight. There's just always going to be that group of men that romanticize war. And they find that they, that they don't think of the, the effects, but they romanticize about it. In the same way, uh, women romanticize about a wedding day. They'll romanticize about combat or war or doing something, and mm -hmm. and they need jujitsu is what they need. They need to be trained in jujitsu or something. But you also have an undeniable system, like in Saudi Arabia, where they sit down the kids in the madrasas and they teach them one plus one is two. There's only one God, Allah, Muhammad is his prophet, and death to America. So there is this undeniable angst against, in certain countries, against Western people that are taught at an institutional level. Now, what I've seen is dependent upon the people that were living in the country I was at. So, for example... People in Iraq, uh, they're more educated. And so the more educated they are, the lazier they become as a people, I've noticed. Really? Yeah, the Afghans are not educated. They're highly intelligent. And the ones that are alive today are because they are so. I mean, think about it. You had all the best technology in the world coming down on those dirt farmers. And they beat us. And they proved one thing. Love. My dad tells an interesting story about tech in Afghanistan. Okay. Um, it was probably like five years ago or so. He visited a hospital in Kabul. And he was retired. He's a retired doctor. And he was looking at some patient and he needed some certain scope. And he half jokingly said, do you have, you know, this kind of scope or this kind of, you know, I don't know what the device was. 
And this old nurse looked at him and said, yeah, hold on. And she went to this locker, or he went to this locker, I don't know the gender of the nurse, went to this locker, unlocked it, and it had been locked since before the Soviet advancement on Afghanistan. They locked it away in a secret spot to keep it away from the Soviet intruders. And this nurse remembered where, and the combination, I guess, got it out. It hadn't been used since, what what was it, 75 or something when the Soviets rolled in? It hadn't been used since the 70s. It still worked, and it had just been invented. It was cutting edge. In the 70s, Kabul hospitals had cutting edge tech. Hmm. And ever since then, it's been held back behind the times. But what a story, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Reality stranger than fiction. Yeah. Oh, they're good at preserving things. They hold on to stuff. One in 30 is literate. Um, but your proposition, is that does that apply to all countries that once they get educated, they get lazy? Seems to be. I don't think that's hard to prove. How do you define lazy? Well, we could start with the obesity. You can start yeah. that as a metric. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. You yeah. can start with just the rise of this undeniable condition called affluenza. Affluenza. Yes. I hadn't heard that word, but that mm -hmm. makes sense. Donald Trump had it. He went to a, a thing for it, like a like a school for it because he had affluenza yeah wait what do you mean just talk about that a little bit yeah it was what is affluenza affluenza is we all suffer from it it's just essentially being spoiled so you you get conditioned to a certain level of affluence mm -hmm. like there's things you, like you could go to lebanon or all those other countries and you'll see piles of trash all over hate it just things that would never be acceptable here in america that's because we're affluent we have a level of like somebody needs to pick up this trash there needs to be trash receptacles you know we yeah so so because and so when you have kids who walk every day to school in those streets passing by garbage and smelling filth and seeing somebody washing clothes in a mud puddle and they're all washing clothes out of the same puddle which is gross and you have them growing up in that and then compared to us we have a totally different standard i i suffered affluenza i had a bad culture sock affluenza when i went into afghanistan just going from here to living out there and having to eat their food what was the first moment when you realized this is worthy of culture shock or this is just so different like break you out of your affluenza Oh, well, it was definitely when driving, well, which war? So I'll go the back first. to Afghan. The first one? Your first. The first, the Iraq war. So driving into Iraq, once you, like in Kuwait and everything, it feels like a big camping trip out in the desert, you know. But once you drive, because we drove in from Kuwait. And, one, and we drove in at night, too. But once you drive in at night and you're driving on the road and you see the, like, disabled tank, disabled tank. And this is 2004, after the invasion. Did it look like Jarhead, the movie? Yeah. It, 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 Oil fields and whatnot? It, it, well, Jarhead was more like Kuwait. I, uh, Kuwait looked like that. But, yeah. no, when you got into Iraq, instantly, different smell smelt horrible just smelt bad like more no methane. like sewage Mo yeah just pure methane so really so that's the that's the first culture shock of these countries that i notice is why does it smell like methane because they have no sewer they have open uh, yep. stagnant water mud puddles they people shit in the street they have no plumbing in some places uh but yeah i was overwhelmed by the smell of methane Methane. Usually, interesting. Yeah. So that's not the smell that I would have thought of, um, but I do know what the open sewage smells like. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid, I always wanted to travel. My parents, of course, were Air Force. My dad was so traveling was a big part of our life, 
and I used to ask them, when can I travel on my own? Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, they would say, eh, when you're 16, if you can pay for it yourself, thinking I'd forget. I didn't. I saved up for years. Then when I was 16, I said, I'm going to go to India. And they let me. That's awesome. Yes. That's frightening. Oh, wow. India is big. It's yeah. scary. Now, a lot of people. They put conditions on it. I had to go visit people they knew. Mm -hmm. So I did. I stayed with people who were longtime friends of the family. And we called it Bombay at the time and Bangalore. Now it's Mumbai and Bengaluru. But I went there for three weeks in each place. It was six, you know, six weeks in the middle of the summer when I was 16. So the summer in India is hot. And it was monsoon season, I think. And it was like nothing I'd ever seen. The first moment I noticed something was very different was in the airport in Bombay. Coming out of the gate, all of a sudden, the main lobby, I think, was uh, it was not air conditioned. Uh, I think I remember seeing goats, mm -hmm. goats on strings in the actual airport mm -hmm. lobby. And these two really little cute kids come up and start asking for money instantly. And I'm thinking about what I should do right now. And then I hear thwack, thwack. And this huge policeman had come over and he was hitting the little children with a riding crop like harder than I've ever hit anyone mm -hmm. in my life, like really, really going into them. And the kids, mm -hmm. you know, jumped and screamed and ran away. And you could tell he does this all day long. Mm -hmm. That's this cop's job. And it was like, this is just in five seconds, I've seen a whole bunch of things I've never seen in my life. And the smell does hit you mm -hmm. right in the face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. You nailed on things that I've seen too. So you notice like one... Yeah, that's another thing with affluenza is in America, we definitely coddle our kids uh, a lot more. Like just the thought of sending your kid to India is a Yeah, the thing. fact Luckily, that my parents, yeah, let and, and they actually let me take my sister with me. It was oh, no the shit. both of us. Damn, I was 16. That must have been really pressuring. I was 16, she was 13. We traveled together and it was amazing. My sister and I have been through a lot together. When I was 18, she was 15, we almost died in the North Atlantic. Oh, we wow. were canoeing off the coast of Maine, and we were in the water for over half an hour. It was 50 degrees. We had capsized because of some waves and wind and whatnot, and we would have died of hypothermia had not someone picked us up. A policeman named Mike Denbo, who was on vacation, just out with his friends on a boat, he saw us. And came over and saved us. Mike Denbo, thank you. I'm alive because of you, man. He lives in Hawaii now. He retired out there. Wow. So you and your sister were out in the Atlantic. Yep. In the ocean, in a canoe. Stupidly. Wow. Well, hey, at least you lived. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome that you lived. But I'm sure that... That that experience with your sister must have was that before going to India or after? After. India? So after two years India. after. Oh, you guys were getting bold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Like yeah. India, we did that. So let's just go in the ocean. Who cares? Mm -hmm. But we used to canoe in that ocean a lot. It was just that one time we almost died. Oh yeah, the sea is. Yeah. The sea is a, a beast, man. Um, this was in an old town canoe, the kind that Boy Scouts use in the river. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to use it on the ocean. No, no, not seaworthy. No, but <laughs> I'm. Yeah, wow. Yeah, you definitely learn respect for the sea. That's for sure. Uh, have you ever been? Have you ever turned your back? Have you ever been on the beach and you turned your back and got hit by a wave that you weren't expecting? It's not fun. I don't sit that close. You mean standing or sitting? Yeah, just standing. Just, just you know, going yes. up to the water's yes. edge. Yeah, yeah. And I then have, you have yeah. your face in the shore, and then just bam, you just get hit by a wave. Yeah. So uh, I went swimming today. I oh, go good. swimming every day in the Spokane River. No shit. Yeah. Love it. You're insane. It's not that cold yet. Okay, no, you're it, not. It, okay, all right. It will get cold, and I'll keep I going. I thought about that. I've thought about, hold on. So every day you go swimming in the Spokane River. I need to let this process because I've thought about this before because I go running around the, mm -hmm. 
I go running by the river and I think, no, I could take it. Yeah. So can. what point are you swimming? I dive in at, it's right near Gonzaga where I live. Mm -hmm. And I literally just dive in and swim around for a bit, like five, 10 minutes a day. That's it. That's awesome. So you opt for the river instead of the, instead of the pool yeah. in the gym. The river, it's cold, so it really does my body good. I can feel the effects afterwards. Like the Wim Hof stuff? I guess like the Wim Hof stuff. I'm nothing compared to that guy. That guy does ice. I mean, literal shaved ice he'll sit in it. I don't know what's going on in his body. But I suspect he has way more brown fat cells than the average person. I never heard of that. Brown fat cells. Brown fat cells contain an extraordinary amount of mitochondria hmm. so they're able to create more atp and they're able to generate more heat and they're usually located in your back near places that can give that heat to your blood hmm. Hmm. so are the cells physically brown i have no idea interesting i don't know why they call that but that would be my guess. Because one thing they say is that if you swim in cold water 11 minutes a week, that's enough to cause your body to grow more brown fat cells. Hmm. Interesting. So is the brown fat the good fat? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, good question. Um, I don't think brown fat cells grow anywhere that you consider fat, like your belly. That's mm. not brown fat cells. That's the other kind, I think. So, yeah, I'd say they're the good kind. I learn something new every day. Yeah. Never know what I'm going to... You know, but you brought up something when you said you went to India and you saw the cop beating the kids. I've seen that a lot. And I saw that in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, in fact, that was another culture shock. Was, And in both these wars, I noticed this phenomenon. So, I call it kid swamp. Kid swamp. It's kid swamp. So what they do is if you are a new unit, and I experienced this in Iraq and Afghanistan. So if you're a new unit in an area, and it's your first time patrolling through this village on foot, what the people do is they pressure test you by sending all their kids. Because they don't like treat their kids like they do in America. I mean, they obviously, they beat the shit out of their kids. kids. Kids there are another mouth to meet, feed, they're a hand to work the field. So... They swamp you with all these kids and they get you to like try to fuck up your patrol, try to pit pocket you, try to do things just to see how you're going to react to these kids. And the correct answer is beat the shit out of the kids. That's the correct answer. That's the correct answer. That's the if only thing that works. If you do not smack those kids, butt stroke those kids, teach them that. I am a military fighting force and you will not use that sort of technique and posturing with me. If you don't set that precedent, the parents are going to look at you like, shit, those kids punked you out. The Taliban's <laughs> going to own you. I know who I'm siding with. Wow. Yeah. It's brutal. Oh. Yeah. Affluence is nice. Affluence is nice. It certainly is. Yeah. But yeah, that's one thing I've thought about, but I'm sure it's, but yeah, you, you notice that in America is different in America. It's, it's so crazy now. Like if you don't, I think Washington state, I, I don't know if it's the law. I know they're trying to get it passed. Like if you don't take your kid to go get gender reassignment surgery, it's you you get child abuse charges as a parent, mm. which is an interesting subject in and of itself. I mean, you go in contrast from that place to America. And yeah, it's a difficult transition. It's a difficult yeah. transition for a lot of veterans to go through too. Yeah. Because it's like being a man coming back to this society, being forced to wear women's clothing, wear makeup and act like a woman. Yeah, it's difficult to do. There's, a, So I understand where veterans come from on that. So, um, so the, the gender stuff is... It's quite something, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's a hot freaking mess. I know you go to Gonzaga. I don't want to go in. <laughs> you don't want, you wanted me to get fired? Yeah, I don't want, I don't want, yeah, like you to get attacked or nothing over my thoughts. So, cool. but, but, uh, but, um, 
but it but but something somebody mentioned like the ancient romans had this thing too yes before i heard that too mm-hmm. um what i do think is wonderful is we have the luxury mm-hmm. to consider these things mm-hmm. what gets me upset is when people forget what gave us the luxury for instance a lot of people seem to hate capitalism. Capitalism is what gave us this luxury. Now, which part of capitalism should we get rid of? The part where people aren't allowed to steal your stuff? Is that the part? Or should we get rid of rule of law? You know, what should we get rid of? Um, obviously, capitalism has issues. Every system has issues. Winston Churchill said, was he the one who said, democracy, it's the worst, except for all the others. And we don't even live in a capitalist country, not perfectly. Mm-hmm. No one does. No one lives in a perfect anything. We have these nice words. The reality is there are laws and there are systems. And our system happens right now to be doing better economically than any, any other system in the history of mankind. It doesn't mean there isn't a better one. Um, what do you think about all that? Oh, uh, capitalism? Uh, you know what? This is what I think. I think capitalism won the Vietnam War. People think we lost that war. And I say no. Every time you turn over a product and it says made in Vietnam, that is evidence we won that war. Because after the war, we attacked in a different direction. It was the veterans that served in that war that became businessmen, that had the balls, the knowledge, the language, and the culture to go back there and negotiate business on America's behalf. And now they are our labor class. I didn't know that's how it happened. Totally. The way I always thought it was, um, we lost the war and won the peace. Interesting. Because of our time there, we had the connections and in-country knowledge to set up those relationships. Mm -hmm. And now it's the preferred low-cost labor resource in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. China is too expensive, Mm -hmm. and there's other political concerns with China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Mexican labor is cheaper and more skilled, too. Yeah, but but yeah, it, th- that's to the point. I mean, it wasn't really that Vietnam was like clung on to communism so much, but it we came back and won the hearts and minds through capitalism. I am hopeful with that in Afghanistan because they have had twenty years of having a better life that they could have never dreamed of, just by just by proxy of us being there. Uh, also, like for example, in uh, so. And I think there's hope for that. I mean, we we warred with an entire generation, 20 years worth of yep. you know, kids. And and the Soviets, another 20 before that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, we... And have, the British before that. Yes. Yeah. It In Afghanistan, <sighs> Afghanistan was a difficult thing because of this. This was America's national defense plan after 9-11, which was... All right. Then there's another thing about the Middle East, too. There's always going to be that inflow of fighters that want to fight us. So our plan was we'll set up an octagon in between two state sponsors of terrorism. And then we will have continuous. If you want to fight us, come here. And they came. Population sink. Population sink. What's that? Population sink is a place that naturally has lower population through time. They're just sinking away, Mm. going down the drain. So if you have an octagon and you know there's a lot of people all over the world that are your enemies, but they're kind of secret and spread out, if Mm -hmm. you can concentrate them all to the octagon, I think that's what you're saying, right? Then it becomes a natural population sink and they just go away. On a very brute force level, yeah, that's definitely how it seems i it seemed to be the natural that was the the defense strategy set up an octagon and every year after the poppy harvest 
because they don't fight during the poppy. No one fights during the poppy. They will walk you through. Got to make that heroin. Yeah, they got to get that. And then during the poppy harvest, the the uh, buyers from Pakistan drive up in their Hondas, like 90-something Honda, and they drive up, buy all the opium, give the Afghans paki, paki rupees, because they don't trust the Afghan dollar. And um, yeah, at least where I was in Helmand, Providence. And Helmand was bordered uh, Pakistan. Pakistan so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, every year it's not hard to get these. Like, for example, uh, some guy in England. Hell, it could be some guy. It could be a white American here. Says, I want to go jihad. Okay. Well, fly over there and do it. No one's stopping you. You want to go fight for Ukraine? Go fly over there. They'd be happy to have you fight for their country. They think they have 15,000 foreigners mm -hmm. fighting for them. Yeah. So the foreign fighters are the worst. They really Really? are evil. Because, I mean, in any situation, whether because they don't care about the people. They show up. They're there to want to get some. They're there to go scratch that itch, to play warfighter, go back home. And say, look what I did, and get all the women and in their own world, right? Because they think they're whatever. So what happens is, they come in to uh, well, let's say let's say you were somebody in England, right? And you're like, I want to go jihad in Afghanistan, and you know, like the right mullah in the right mosque, and he's like, all right, we'll get you hooked up in the right situation. We'll fly you down. It tell you what, if you go jihad for the summer, we'll pay for your college. Okay. No they shit. do that? Yeah. I mean, no one jihads for free. It's like a GI Bill. <laughs> like, it, it's this war as a, wow. as a service, That's as a business. I war mean, as a service. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mercenary. So uh, they're like, yeah, if you, if you go down and you come back, and we'll pay for your college. Like, okay, cool. And you'll be a great recruitment tool for all of our other people because everything you did was over there. Yeah, you know, you didn't do it here, and so they'll they'll be like, okay, yeah, we're in England. We'll send you down to a nicer school, nicer training school down in uh, Iran, which is right on the border, and they'll train you up and they'll teach you better stuff than what you would get trained in if you came from a poorer country. They'd send you to Pakistan. You'll get the discount budget training. And, and the suicide bombers, these are the ones, these are the hardcore madrasa trained people. These are the ones that like, since they were kids, they were like, there is no God or the only God yeah. is Allah and Muhammad. To, are they usually orphans? Uh, they might be orphans. They, but either way, there's a lot of trauma and sexual abuse that happens to generate a high population of psychopaths. So that's not uncommon, and especially with like the bacha balza, which was a horrible thing to the, the, the prostitution of boys in Afghanistan. They dress oh, them up gosh. like girls and they make them dance and then they rape them. Gosh, I didn't know yeah, about that. The bacha balza. It's a real thing. Um, not everybody's about that. Yeah, but it's not uncommon. <laughs> You know, Gosh. it's part of the culture. And like, you don't see it until you see some boy dress up like a girl. It's and then like, you know. The fuck? You know, and it, yeah, it, it's part of their culture. And, and it's also, it's an interesting dichotomy with homosexuality in the Arab world. Because too. they see themselves as not homosexual, mm-hmm. but then they have the bacha balza. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then in Iraq, the joke was, Man, boy, love Thursdays, forgiveness Fridays. <laughs> so it, it, which is strange. So in Iraq, they have like culturally accepted homosexuality that's not called homosexuality. Pedophilia even. Yeah, they even have pedophilia and they don't even call it that or consider it that. And then you go across the border into Iran where they'll throw you off a building or reverse hang you for being homosexual. Reverse hang. Yeah, reverse hanging is when they hang them by a crane. So they just lift you up from there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's how they do reverse hangings. Um, so that 
so yeah, they have strange dichotomies with that. Um, but then again, you know, this it's the world. It, it's America's a Disneyland fantasy compared to the real world. I try to tell Americans this all the time. They really don't get it. Yep. And they think like, oh, you could just go down the street to Seven Eleven, go pick up whatever you need. I'm like, no, there ain't none of that. There's like, if you get hurt, there's no nine one one. There's no hospital. Yeah. There's there's no nothing like these. Everything is dirt poor, and and the low tech beats high tech every time because we noticed. Okay, so the foreign fighters come. And they get in one or two gunfights with us. They get murdered quick. Really? Quick. They don't stand a chance. So the ones that survived go back to the same tactic, which was hire kids to plant the IEDs. Really? So the entire war in Afghanistan, and I show people the proof and evidence. I've done blog articles, and I have all the things to show it. Like, this was a war against children. We were fighting child soldiers. So after, yeah, these Afghan kids are hard. They smoke. They they live a hard life. They're always working the fields. They have no school. No school. We went there. My platoon tried to get a school started because there was this school right next to our patrol base, and it was just full of squatters. So we could kick the squatters out, and we could have the kids start going to school in this little— it was actually made of bricks, not mud like the other homes, but— yeah, but that didn't happen. We found the mullah who was willing to teach. He could read and write, and he was teaching kids on his own, in his own compound. But at the end of the day, it, and then we had this massive shura, so a big meeting with all the local Taliban. And when I lived in the in the complex, in the patrol base I lived, I lived with Taliban. Really? Reality is stranger than fiction. Yeah. You, look, the guys who built that transformer. So we were at this patrol base I was at. It was called PB Transformer, and it transformed power that went from uh, the Kajaki Dam, ten miles north, down to our patrol or to our transformer. And then the transformer would splice out and run, you know, wires all over throughout the rest of the Sangin district. And so. Yeah, these guys, we were eating dinner with them every night. We knew they were Taliban. Absolutely Taliban. They had radios and were ra- we caught them communicating with the Taliban in the radio. But the fact is, these are the only guys that know how to run this damn transformer. <laughs> like, you're dead in the water if, like, if these guys aren't here. And there were six of them, and they had shifts and whatnot. And they were, I guess, wealthier. That's crazy to me, because I thought... We brought in all our own engineers. No, no, nobody knows how to run that <laughs> that thing. And, and, but of course, they never claimed they were Taliban, but mm. they were totally Taliban. I mean, they had terrain models of the patrol base outside of their homes. There was just like so much. I journaled everything, and I'm gonna publish that uh, as a book someday. But yeah, you should. Yeah, it's a really cool book. Uh, it's a really cool, fascinating story because I used. I had to survive in this minefield. So after the foreign fighters come, they get killed. They go back to the same tactic, which is pay the kids to put in the mines. And so um, it turns into just minefield warfare, literally. I, I went through, like the battalion amputation rate was well over 23% for foot patrols. So every day, you didn't know those stats going out. And nobody talked about that. You don't know it till afterward. Wow. You didn't know it until like you talked to the Marines that came back and they're like, yeah, man, it's like really high. It's like every day you're rolling the dice. You got snake eyes. You're going to lose something. So <sighs> it was really high amputation rate. There was there was patrols that were so demoralized, Marine patrols, certain platoons that were so demoralized that they wore a tourniquet prepped on every limb for the inevitable. But what helped my platoon survive was a lot of factors one that we were blessed to be living with the taliban really (laughs) and uh we befriended them and so you start to learn from them the taliban how the intelligence works in the ao in the area and i learned okay okay there's no there's no secret the foreign fighters come all right we see them coming um 
But the foreign fighters came. Whoever was originally Taliban in Afghanistan is dead. Long dead. Really? Whoever is, what is Taliban? Taliban is a shadow government. That's it. Because that, that's what the people want is governance. They want something. And I had something that they never had, which was an ID card maker. And this damn ID card maker kept us alive because, so these guys have never had IDs. Anybody, ever. They have no proof that they are who they say they wow. are. Like, we're affluent to the point where it's like, well, I'll go get a new ID card. Here's mm -hmm. my ID card. I, I know where to get one. I know how to get one. Not them. They've never, there's no registry of their birth, wow. of anything. They're, and so we had this biometric system called the BAT system, which was really cool. So we could get all their fingers, iris scans, face scans. So if they touched an ID or if we found like something and their fingerprints were on it, it you know, we you'd can, know who. Yeah. And it was a federal, it's an FBI database, the BAT system. Um, so it's hard to get people to get them to take a picture. But they want IDs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. As soon as you pull out a camera, and I got a bunch of pictures of it too. So like as soon as you pull out a camera, they're hiding their face. Really? And people hide their face. Kids hide their face. And they're taught that. Wow. Some adult taught them that, that you need to hide your face when the Marines pull out a camera. And so, okay, so that now it's really impossible. It's damn near impossible to get them to give up their damn biometrics, let alone get a picture, you know, straight of force, forcefully getting their biometrics. And so how do you give them an incentive to give them your biometrics? Well, just so happens I took this ID card maker from the battalion, uh, the battalion CP at the time when I was there at that specific base, they had this Connex box that was sealed off and I was rifling through it looking for some gear. And I found the ID card maker with a bunch of blank IDs. I'm like, okay, cool. And so this might come in handy. And so mm -hmm. I took it with me to the patrol base. It was worth its weight in gold because I would go out you'd have to patrol through this minefield and then get biometrics from people. And I'd say, all right, look, he gave me biometric or he gave me his biometrics. I gave him an ID card. And then all of a sudden I turned into the ID card delivery guy. And so our platoon was protected. Like, okay, if that, wow. if they get hit, no ID cards and we'd let them know if we get killed, no ID cards, one person gets killed, no ID cards. They kept us alive. People so went in front of us. Wow. Yeah. And because every day, because I had random people's ID cards on me, or at least I gave that illusion. So when I'm out and about and I see yep. the same person, oh, Mary John, yeah, you gave here me you go. Yes, sir, here you go, Mary John. Here you go, Mary John. Uh, the battalion found out that I was doing this. And they instantly sourced a patrol out of their way to, to go and take, compensate that ID card maker from me while I was on patrol oh. because people kept trying to get in yeah. to the base with their ID, which are was you serious? a shitty ID <laughs> card. It's like a Costco can make you something better, you know, but, but all it said was this man's name is Mira John McMod. He son of whatever McMod, uh, we've received his biometrics. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's literally it. But to them, it was worth their weight in gold and it had a picture of him too so uh yeah so just going out every day wow. delivering these id cards was really what helped keep yeah. us alive in my platoon it's, it's too here. bad that they didn't reward that instead they took it away from you oh they were shit they were afraid well the whole battalion's getting fucked up well here's the thing war is war yeah at the end of the day those casualties that would have been us those foreign fighters were diverted to the north and the south of our position to fuck mm. up those Marines. And that's what happened. So all I did, yeah, I shifted I the equilibrium, but it went back to equilibrium. Like, so, now, so it was a combination of the Taliban workers that we were living with us, who we made really good rapport with, eating with them every night and sharing gigs of porn, which was worth its weight in gold, because they don't have porn. And... 
Marines have the best porn. Some of the raunchiest <laughs> shit. But either way, like, I'm just sitting there, like, hanging out with Muhammad Isa. He's this 55-year-old man. He's got 13 to 16 kids. I don't know. I think three died. It was hard for him to articulate that. But he'd smoke his cigarette in his knuckles. He'd put his cigarette in his knuckles, and he'd just smoke through the hole in his no hand. No way. Yeah. And I'm like, God, that's really cool. And so that way you'd never, like, actually touch mouths on a cigarette. Like, oh, oh, interesting. Yeah. And so we'd hang out. And, and it's because we did those simple things, like hang out with them, eat dinner. And they wanted to hang out and eat dinner with us. They wanted, uh, you know, us to tell them their lives and try to get information out of them. And, and, and we just befriended them. And they're still great people. I hope only the best for them. But they kept us alive because wow. they told not only were they Taliban, I'm pretty sure one of them was definitely the Taliban commander, for sure, of that area. And they controlled the power of the entire district. The electrical so power. So no one's going to fuck with these guys. Yeah. So they kept us alive. And wow. survived that seven months. And then, yeah. Got now, back. riddle me this. They wanted governance. Mm-hmm. Why didn't they want the governance that the Afghan government provided for them. Not the Taliban, the other. They didn't believe in their government. They didn't trust their government. They loved the ANA. They loved the Afghan National Army because they were Afghans, Hmm. even though they couldn't speak the same language. So, So you got government Afghans from the Afghan government, and that was the entire purpose, is try to make, try to convince the people of Sangin District that their government is legit. We could not convince them of that. Why? We could not believe that. Because you, there's no way. <laughs> Shit, the government couldn't control the foreign fighters. They couldn't control the flow. The every There was... Uh, well, here's the thing. When you have just a regular village in a war zone that isn't touched by war, they're happy. They're functioning. They're at equilibrium. But when somebody comes, whether it's Marines or Taliban, the roads get blown up. The bridges get blown up. You can't take your goats to market. Your kids get killed. And now you got it. Now you got all these problems and economic issues. And you can start to, and if it gets really bad, you can start to predict attacks based off of like produce prices at the bazaar. Or really? Yeah. There's so many things. But then again, the attacks were very, I mean, you knew you were going to get ambushed in Afghanistan for sure. There was no surprise about that. It, it was, they would s- throw up smoke signals. So to throw up smoke from one compound and smoke from another compound is like left and right lateral limits to let the foreign fighters know that, hey, the Marines are in between these two mm-hmm. things with smoke. It was pretty primitive, but it worked. But and it also was great for psyops against us because they're fucking thr- flying up smoke everywhere. People are leaving mass exodus. People leave their and you know when an attacks coming because the people let you know. They just look at you like you're a ghost. Because one time, mm. yeah, they look at you like you're a ghost. Like, oh god, I should not be here right now, and they're gone. Wow. And, yeah. And like we're about to get attacked. There was like sometimes where there was this time where. Uh, these dudes were they were going through the bazaar and they knew they were about to get attacked because everybody in the bazaar got on their face. So, and, and there's other things too, like... So everybody knows and they're not going to tell you. Oh yeah, they know. They're not going to tell you. They know where the IEDs are. They're not going to tell you. They know who's planting them. They know when they come. and They know the kids that are planting them. Yeah, my fucking kids did that. And that's another problem too is the kids are the highest casualties. The highest casualties. They're always fucking it up. Wow. Uh, yeah. It kind of seems like once you get to adulthood there, maybe you feel like, now I don't have to fight. Is that kind of the feeling that some of them would have? Like, I did that already. You know what? I had this company commander once say, they're all guilty of something. It's just a matter of finding out what it is which is almost like a fucked up Vietnam version. Yeah. But 
the way when you were suffering every day, you're hearing explosions, you're hearing uh, mass casualties happen in one location or or amputation today. It's just it's a daily thing. Like somebody lost a leg, somebody in Charlie Company lost a leg, somebody in Bravo Company lost, a leg, somebody in Weapons Company, and it's, and it's not mm. really gunshots. I mean, the most of the shooting was just to bait you into an IED ambush. Wow. And and the thing is, they had to predict exactly where you're going to step because these are pressure plate, so low tech pressure plate. So when it comes to high tech or low tech beats high tech. So for example, we spent ungodly amounts of money putting these mind rollers, so which are like a reverse trailer on the front yep. of our vehicles to run over the pressure Mines, plates. Yeah, you know what the Afghans did? What offset the pressure plate from the explosive with cheap wire. The distance. Oh. Low tech beats high tech. So when you hit it with the roller, it blows up behind you where you are. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. Okay. My favorite story of low tech beats high tech. I don't know if it's totally true, but it's probably true. Supposedly, we spent a lot of money developing radar based mortar trackers mm-hmm. that we deployed in Vietnam. And when a mortar came at you, it used radar plus some, you know, for the time, very complex computer machinery mm-hmm. to reverse engineer where the mortar had been shot from. Mm-hmm. And then we can directly target it and get them on the next go. Mm-hmm. Well, the Russians, knowing we had spent so much that these systems cost a million dollars a piece, supposedly, and they gave their allies a 10 cent diode that would light up whenever our system was turned on. So a 10 cent diode defeats a $1 million machine. Mm-hmm. Yep. Low tech beats high tech. And I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about because I'm a mortarman. You've I was heard a, of this? Yeah. So I had five MOSs. My first MOS was a mortarman because of infantry. So when you go, I knew I wanted to be infantry. So they're like, all right, so infantry, what do you want to be? Rifleman, rocketman, what, you know? I'm like, I want to be one that doesn't get in much combat. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, because I didn't want What does want that it. even mean? Like, I didn't want... Like, I... So, I infantry. joined the infantry, but I didn't want to go to war, kind of. Like, I didn't want to... Yeah. Stupid choice. If you're a grunt, you're going to be fighting. At, no. And so, I'm like, I'll be a mortarman, because they're, like, further back, and they shoot mortars. I see. Yeah. Uh wrong if you're a grunt you're a grunt you're a rifleman you're a, you're out patrol and, and and it's and that's like been the the theme of my life like i tr- as much as i tried to just avoid direct gunfighting i was just thrown into it because i was a mortarman and i was an infantryman so they're like you're infantry you're fucking oh three you know where you're gonna go fight and so yeah, before I knew it, like even in Sangin, I thought I had it good. I thought we were just going to be on the gun line, chilling at some big fob. And that's initially how it was for like the first month. And then we took, and then the battalion took several mass casualties. And then before I know it, hey, 81 Splatoon, you got your own patrol base and now you're patrolling. And then Sergeant Segalini is leading a bunch of scared 19 year olds through a, a minefield every day. And so you have to walk in a straight line. You mark the trail with shaving cream. You stay to the right. So I was always the second man. The first man had a minesweeper to try to pick up on any sort of metal detection at all. And so high tech or low tech beats high tech. So once they started realizing we're sweeping with minesweepers, what they did was they made low metallic pressure plates. So what they did was they would take C batteries and they would burn them and they would rip out the carbon rods out of C batteries. And then they would have just two thin pieces of copper wire running over the, uh, the carbon rods to isolate them from the wooden pressure plate. The wooden pressure plate was separated by a piece of foam from a sandal that was cut, put into both sides. And then, of course, there was two, four carbon rods, two wires on top of each other, wrapped in a bunch of tape and uh, it was waterproofed, not that waterproof, but and that's what. Uh, but either way, you step on it. it you can't. The only thing a metal detector is going to really pick up on, and those things whine all the time. All 
they're hard to pick up on it. And barely, rarely has anybody actually found a pressure plate short of visual indicators with a with a metal detector. Um, they, they usually miss it. And it's usually like the sixth dude bat that wow. steps on it on the trail that you thought was clear. <sighs> and... And the things that they could actually pick up with is is if the sweeper swept far and he got a metal hit from the power source because they offset the power sources. So the wires are running to like three 9-volt batteries stacked on top of each other and wrapped in tape and buried. Wow. So, but yeah, then again, you have to be leaving patterns. You have to be so predictable that they can predict the exact step you're going to take. But in some cases, like where the battalion took a mass casualty and they didn't leave overwatch on the area and they had to go back the next day to look for more gear because it, shit goes everywhere when somebody blows up. And guess what the Taliban did? Shit IEDs all over that night because nobody had overwatch. They go in again. Boom. Company commander loses his leg on that one. Man. And then more mass cas. It's nuts. So... Hey, it's easy to cheat, and make an explosive like, and, and you think about it. And I thought about it during the firefight too. Like we take one shot, like one or two rounds, <laughs> go over it. We get down, everybody starts unloading in a direction. And I thought they shot like a dollar at it and we're responding with thousands of dollars. <laughs> that's probably part of the point. Yeah, that's part of the point. And so yeah. you had to, you have to respond with proportionate force. And a lot of people, they get scared and they go for, we need the big bomb. We need to drop a bomb, drop a bomb. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it's tough. It's, it's tough in that counterinsurgency environment because there's two schools of thought in the military and they're always conflicting. One is on the conventional sense and one is on counterinsurgency. And it is very easy to say you're all about counterinsurgency until you start taking a bunch of casualties and then you just realize, oh, this is just hell. I just have to survive this. All these people are against me. All these kids are trying to kill me. All these, and, 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 then, and then it becomes a survivalist mentality at that point. And when you're in survival mode, everybody becomes an enemy. And So I have a friend who grew up in Iraq. Hmm. And then he left and went to England for a while and then became a U.S. citizen. And what he told me was that watching the Iraq war play out, he realized it would have been cheaper and more effective to just tell everyone, okay, um, if you overthrow Saddam, we'll put you on the American payroll for a few years. Um, maybe even like 5000 a year for everybody. Mm -hmm. Every citizen in Iraq, that would have been cheaper something like that and more effective what do you think oh yeah um well you saw what happened after we got rid of saddam and then isis happened isis wouldn't have happened if saddam was there now saddam was an evil dude i don't know if oh, your yeah. friend ever told you oh yeah he told saddam me this story did. he said that when iran had their revolution saddam was like hey we're not going to have that here and just to make sure people know we're not going to have it here, he got the brother of the Ayatollah at the time. I guess mm -hmm. he was in Iraq. And he got him and his family in a room, had his family raped in front of his eyes, and then killed them, and then lit the guy's beard on fire and watched him die. And that was, like, typical for Saddam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's typical. I mean, most of the... To give it to him, I mean, most of this violence at the time was state ran. I mean, there was a little bit of sectarian violence. I mean, you had, it was on top of a similar, simmering civil war between the Shunis and the Shiites. But in Iraq? Yeah. I mean, they were, they've been fighting yeah. each other, especially in that Najaf, where I was at the Holy yeah. Shiite Cemetery. That's like always, and man, I remember it was a bad bomb. It was actually one a bad car bomb. That was a nasty. That was Christmas Day. Yeah, but the uh, yeah, Saddam was the head of the Bath Party. Yeah, which party. patterned themselves on the Nazis. Mm -hmm. 
one thing I remember watching, they still have black and white video footage, not movie, video of mm -hmm. him hit on his first day in charge of the bath party in Iraq. And he's sitting on stage, literally smoking oh, a stove. Smiling and sending yeah. people to their deaths. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sending people to their deaths. They get dragged out of the auditorium, shot right there, and everyone can hear it. And everyone else who's still in the theater is like, long live Saddam. You know, Saddam mm -hmm. is the greatest. Well, of course, they're very supportive. Mm -hmm. But he just looks like such a psychopath. Mm -hmm. Like he's somewhere between enjoying it and not caring. Mm -hmm. But so good at causing fear in everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's He was a master of state-ran terrorism. I mean, he... ISIS learned what they learned from Saddam. Like, he was good. He, he set the standard for terror. Yeah, beheadings was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now, is that why Hamas is doing beheadings? They beheaded all those babies. Uh, yeah, that's sad as fuck. Um, they behead because of the verse in the Quran where it says, strike the serpent at the neck. And that's pretty much been the basis for why they use that M.O. of beheadings. And, um, yeah. That's yeah globally, it, it strikes fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, the French, famous for all their beheadings mm -hmm. in the late 1700s. I mean, did they break the record? Maybe. I heard that the Juarez cartel beheaded more people than ISIS. Probably. In the, the same cartel time is nasty, man. Yeah. And people forget that in the border cities of Rosarita, Tijuana, and Juarez, there's over 300 murders a month. That's a lot. How do they still have people? Yeah, I know. But people are getting murdered because they just keep running drug cartel crime. Yeah, Mexico is a strange possibility. If we make it safe, mm -hmm. it will be so productive and just such a great partner for the U.S. And anything we make in Asia, we could make in Mexico. And you just drive here in a truck rather than having to wait for it to come on a boat across the ocean. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit like Afghanistan mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. dry and hilly and full of AK-47s. Yeah. I will say, though, I think we were using capitalism to try to change that because if... Yes. I mean, it makes sense with the labor war. If I mean, if they, we started a trade war with China, and we're like, all right, we're not going to do any more manufacturing in China. We're moving it all to Mexico. Yeah, it makes sense. And then at the same time, if we have... I don't think the drug cartel issue is a problem that couldn't be solved. Oh, totally be that, solved. Totally. I, I feel that if America was to do some sort of insurgency campaign and go into Mexico, that would be an insurgency we could win because we have a high population in at least 10% Hispanic that serve <laughs> in the military. So they so, have the knowledge and the language. And I the think culture. there's one problem, though. Part of... What I think went wrong in Afghanistan is they knew we weren't going to stay. Mm, yeah, that's true. Yeah. They knew for us, it's a finite game. Mm -hmm. Like if you follow Simon Sinek at all, he mm -hmm. talks about game theory mm -hmm. and how if you're playing a finite game, but your opponent's playing the infinite game, you're eventually going to lose. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. The Vietnamese knew we want to stay here. We're going to stay. Mm -hmm. You're not. So we're just going to wait you out. Mm-hmm. Same thing in Afghanistan. Like we waited out the British, we waited out the Soviets, we were going to wait you out. And they did. They knew that we didn't like being there. Um, whereas if you've, you're talking about people that want to stay, it's a very different situation. Now, where that breaks down is Palestine and Israel. They both mm. want to stay. Yeah. Um, it is present because it's in the news right now, but it really is one of those things that my whole life I felt like I don't know what to do there. Mm -hmm. I know that I like life. I don't like dying. I think everyone else feels the same way. Um, if I'm in a society where I feel like I have 
a possible future. I can mm-hmm. grow, I can have a career, I can become a better version of myself. I'm going to dedicate myself to that. I'm not going to go out and trying to kill people. Mm-hmm. Um, if I felt like someone is attacking me or my loved ones, I would put my life on the line. And in there, I feel like there's there are people who they're stuck in a cycle of violence and mm-hmm. I don't know the way out. Mm-hmm. But I look at it. We're all looking at it in the whole world and just trying to figure that out. And I don't know what the answer is. Well, I can extrapolate. I don't have an answer. Um, this is very studied. Uh, I mean, shit, I've been to multiple schools where they're, uh, where they're like, look, we have tried profiling these terrorists. You can profile them. And that's the problem is a lot of them can be profiled. Um, but the, yeah, yeah, you can profile them and it doesn't seem like education is the issue because you'll have a doctor who blows himself up. You'll have some, it, it's a matter of how, yeah, how entrenched are they into that ideology? Yeah. I mean, and it's not just about religion because um, from what I've heard, um, the only people who hate the Palestinians more than the Israelis are many other Arabs mm. who share religion with them. Mm-hmm. Why? What's going on? I have no idea. Um, but I am I look at them, and they've been stuck in a cycle of violence for a long time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, since 1947, we've all been talking about it. But do you know how to say Palestinian in Arabic? Palestinia. No. Palestinia? Palestinia. Palestinia. Remember like the, the Philistines, Philistines in the yeah. Bible? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's connected. Yeah. So we're talking 1500 BC when David and Goliath fought. Things haven't calmed down since, as far as I can tell. Mm-hmm. This is the one of the longest simmering conflicts in history, as far as I can tell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, man, I. Here's the thing about these, these psychos is, well, here's the thing about the Islamic Islam, though it's a religion of peace. The Quran, from what I've been told, is the Quran is compiled backwards. So the, uh, what should be the, the peaceful life is the warring part of Muhammad. Yeah, he was a warlord. Let's not forget this. No. I mean, I've read the Quran. I read it. Uh, it's great. It's It's got some good, great stories in it. I like the way it's structured. Um, but, yeah, you got all the warring in, or, or all the warring in the back half when it should be in the front half. And so it's kind of like ass back. So temporally, it started off mm-hmm. with the back half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so it's starting off in the peaceful days, and then and then it goes back into the the Islamic raider days when he was doing the caravans and whatnot. But yeah, there is that aspect. I mean, a lot of Americans try to turn a blind eye to this. Like, no, man. It's like it's. It was based on a warlord. Like, mm-hmm. Jesus wasn't a warlord. Jesus is unique. Yeah. So, I am I grew up super strict Christian. Mm-hmm. I consider myself an atheist now. But okay. I probably listen to more gospel music than any other atheist alive. I admire so much about who Jesus was. And even if it's more than one person who those words actually come from. Like some people say, love the Lord, your your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Mm-hmm. They think the Gamaliel actually said that first. Um, he was, I guess, Hillel's student or something. But at the time, might made right. The Roman Empire, they're mm-hmm. like, you know, we're, we're right because we have more swords and we can kill you. Mm-hmm. And then Jesus comes along and says, no, something else, you know, let them hit the other cheek, go the extra mile, 
which is an interesting story in itself because Roman subjects had to walk carrying stuff one mile if any Roman officer asked them because they're, in a sense, subjects of the empire. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, go the extra mile. Go another mile because then that changes the power dynamic you're giving now instead of being commanded like a slave. Mm. And the whole give them the extra cheek thing, it's kind of like a power play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, you hit me. And in my peaceful state, I'm going to show that I'm stronger. Mm -hmm. So it was a very unique message. It was like strength through weakness, in a sense. Strength through humility. And I, I get the feeling that this is a message that was unique at the time, and maybe in all of history before this. Some people say that it's similar to some messages coming from, you know, the Buddha or whatever. But I do see something unique in Jesus. And it was not like the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament, when God told him to kill the Amalekites, he said, you know, make sure there's no trace of them left. Like God said, do genocide, but make sure you do it perfectly. Don't leave any of them. Not even their animals, you know, that kind of thing. So Jesus is unique. Mm -hmm. No, it, it, well, you, you made me think about something, which was a major problem in the Middle East. No, they do not turn the other cheek. They don't. They can't. You assaulted their honor. They must take blood. They must, especially in, in Afghanistan, according to the Pashtuwali. Like if somebody, like if, you know, so if, if somebody goes to you for help, you got to help them. But if somebody wronged you, you must seek vengeance. And it might take 10 years, but you need to do it. Or your honor is at stake. Yeah. Now let's talk about what that actually means. What does it mean your honor is at stake? That means if your honor is not great, other people will do it to you as well. Mm -hmm. And I believe that game, game theory mm -hmm. is a good way to model this. If you're in a society where the society will not protect you, the rule of law will not protect you, you have to do that yourself. Everyone has to be their own rule of law. You hurt me, you're going to get hurt back. That's where we came from. We all came from that originally. So it's there deep inside us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It, it's very, very primal. And you're right. It's a system of violence where one begets the other begets the other. And, and I can see where the palace, I can see where the Palestinians are coming from. You know, they're stuck in or the Gaza Strip. Is it all yeah. connected? I'm not that. The Gaza Strip is all connected, but the West Bank is not. Okay, yeah. So if you look at the West Bank, it's a whole bunch of little enclaves. And that's considered Palestine as well. And then yeah. and then there's the Gaza Strip, which is basically a terrorist camp with <laughs> a terrorist community. Yep. Um, it's a pirate community. Yeah. Pirates. But there's interesting or complicated history. For instance, mm -hmm. um, they wanted to have their own elections, and mm -hmm. Israel said, okay, you can have your own elections. And it wasn't, Hamas wasn't the clear winner. They had to share power with Fatah. Mm -hmm. And then Israel like, was like, okay, you guys figure it out. And <laughs> Hamas was like, we figured it out. We'll kill them. So they killed all the Fatah leaders. Mm -hmm. And now Hamas is in charge. And Israel was like, yeah, that's not the political process we were thinking of. That's when the recent blockade started. There's levels to this. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And then the and then the thing is if you bombed them all would they all just be fighting over craters in the ground? Yeah. Well, there is a certain level of they look out in the world and the rest of the world seems to be having a great time. And they have cell phones and they can see what we're up to. We're all having a great time. They're like we don't have a future. Mm -hmm. And especially if they're stuck if they're physically trapped in yep. that in the West Bank not allowed to go to Egypt not allowed to go to Jordan Jordan's like we don't want them Egypt's like we definitely don't want them mm -hmm. in fact Egypt probably spends more money preventing Palestinians coming in than anywhere else mm -hmm. on their borders and if I were Palestinian I would feel hopeless like well 
if the best I can do is hope for, you know, some great paradise, maybe I'd go for that. I mean, it's what I think was going through the minds of our founders when they founded this country Mm -hmm. was every system seems to crush humans after a while, Mm. crush most humans, Mm -hmm. everyone except the rich. So let's make a system designed to protect certain rights. And that's what they did. Maybe for the first time ever. I mean, even like the inventors of democracy back in Athens, they had tons of slaves, like mostly slaves. Mm -hmm. Um, But now for the first time, we set up paperwork that protected human rights. And it wasn't until the end of the Civil War that we extended that to all the humans. And even then, it's been a it's been a battle. But at least we set the aspiration. We set the original paperwork to make a system for the humans in the system. We got to protect that. Mm -hmm. And if you're a human in a system that has rule of law, you don't have to protect your honor all the time. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go kill everyone that wronged Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, you you are relieved of the burden of revenge. Exactly. Yeah, that's what Jordan Peterson said. You were relieved of the burden of revenge. That's a really good way to put it. Now, people in Gaza Strip don't have that. They're not in that system. They don't have a future. And I believe that anytime you have a whole bunch of people, 2.3 million people, that don't have a future, bad shit is going to happen. It's eventual. Mm Mm-hmm. If you have a whole bunch of people that don't have a future, bad shit will happen. Mm -hmm. Just like, oh, let's put the dinosaurs on an island. They won't get out. Mm -hmm. Life finds a way. Mm -hmm. Especially intelligent humans, we always find a way. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a plan where every human on Earth can work toward a future and benefit from their work. Mm -hmm. Now, the word we use is capitalism. People seem to hate capitalism. I don't see why. Why would young people be taught to hate capitalism? Capitalism just means you get to work for something and benefit from your work. And people aren't allowed to steal it from you or kill you. Mm-hmm. Isn't that great? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice. And and we exist, yeah, because we are a nation of laws and business relies on truth and trust. And if there's no truth and trust, you know, there's not going to be any business Man, when I it seems like with Palestine, if you were to take all the Palestinians and just relocate them to a different country, then it'd be another country's problem. You kick the can down the road, and then they could create their own country there. But then again, that's not the way to do it. So that's just passing the buck. If we pretended that we could provide another mm-hmm. country for the Palestinians, that each of the people who chose to go to the new place could probably have a great life. But one of the things that a lot of people are holding on to in that area is a specific piece of land Mm -hmm. that this specific spot in land belongs to us. And by their own stories, they're all brothers. They're all children of Abraham. All the Israelis come from, you know, one of Abraham's kids and all Arabs come from Abraham's other kid. So they all literally say we're brothers and they're still fighting and they're fighting over that land. And I don't know, I get it. Mm-hmm. If my father owned a huge ranch, I'd want a piece of it. And if my other brothers said, no, you can't have it. In fact, I'm going to kill you and take your piece. I'd be upset. Yeah, you're so right. And I if they it. had a government there that said, Actually, if you don't pay the tax, we're taking the land. Then that would change the dynamic itself. Because mm. I think of that here, we don't have that. It's like, well, you know, you get your own thing. You can go do your own stuff in life. Yeah. So, which brings up another point, which I always ask people. So I ask people these questions. What is money? Oh, money is such a great invention. Um, first of all, We all know that it's really hard to trade 
just the right things to just the right people in just the right time. If you have fresh chicken and you want to trade it for, you know, some fish that someone else hasn't even caught yet, how do you do that? Well, maybe you promise, you have memories, and you fulfill your promises, but it all gets so complex. Money hides complexity. That's one of the greatest things it does. Um, the real economy are the things. I eat food. I don't eat money. I don't wear money. I don't drive around in money. I don't live in a house made of money. Mm -hmm. I live in a house made of bricks and glass and metal and wood. I drive around in something made out of metal and plastic that runs on gasoline that was, you know, obtained out of the ground. Who knows where? Mm -hmm. My car has about 30,000 parts. They're all sourced all over the world. There's so much complexity that gets simplified if you can use money. Mm -hmm. They can just say, you know, these parts are worth this amount of dollars. And these other parts are worth this amount of dollars. And the labor to put them together is this amount of dollars. It's just dollars. And the amount of stuff we all have because we don't have to pay complexity cost is amazing. Now, the U.S. is the most fortunate country that has ever existed, partly because of chance. First of all, I know it's depressingly sad that we committed a genocide on the Native Americans. That is horrible. After we had control of this country from coast to coast, there is a certain kind of wealth that we obtained, which is unseen in history, where we have non-enemies on our borders, pretty much. I know we had mm -hmm. some wars with the War of 1812 and mm -hmm. then war with Mexico and whatnot, but it wasn't a big deal. So we have this massive piece of land in the temperate zone. We have something like 25% of the world's top quality farmlands. And it's enervated by navigable rivers, which is so cheap for transport, so much cheaper than train, and of course, way cheaper than truck. And those rivers go right to the international waters in the Gulf of Mexico. It's like, what could be better? So first of all, we have, in terms of making the stuff you wear and eat and the homes you build, we're already set up to be the richest country in all of history. And then World War I happens, and we don't get any damage. Then World War II happens, and every industrialized country in the world gets destroyed except for us. Japan went around beating up on China and the Philippines and taking their gold. Italy and Germany go around Europe beating them up and taking all their gold. Our allies, the free French and the British come to us for help. And we're like, sure, we'd love to help our friends. It's not free, though. Oh, and by the way, um, we're not exactly accepting pounds and francs right now. So, but you can pay us in gold. So by the end of World War II, we had most of Britain and France's gold. We had all their bases worldwide. And then we win the war and we get the Japanese gold and the German gold after they had plundered everybody. And the South China Sea. Yes. So as of 1945, the U.S. had something like 85% of the world's gold on top of already having this land mass, which is in itself the true wealth. Mm -hmm. And we controlled the oceans. And then we told everyone, yeah, we're not doing gold anymore. Let's do dollars instead. And, of course, it rolled out over a mm -hmm. few years. There was the Bretton Woods Accords in 1944. But in 1971, Nixon really brought us off the gold standard. And then it was the dollar. And now if, you know, Laos sells rice to Cambodia, they do the transaction in dollars. Mm -hmm. And for someone to use dollars, it's because there's many of them. Mm -hmm. And it's stable and dependable. That's not true or even close to true for any other currency. 
So it's going to be this way for a long time, but not forever. The reason we don't use the pound as the most trusted currency is probably because the British Empire is not an empire anymore. Mm. So is the U.S. an empire? It's not the same kind of empire. It's more like an ideas empire where if you're open to our markets, you will be friends with us. Mm -hmm. And even if you're, you have a government we still totally disagree with, like Vietnam, mm -hmm. you can be close partners with us if you interact economically mm -hmm. with us. And even though Vietnam is a very close ally of us now mm -hmm. because of that, economics doesn't trump everything. Mm -hmm. The Germans believe that economic interests with Russia would make them peaceful members of Europe. That didn't play out so well mm -hmm. because for some people, it's not just about economics. It's about maybe power and glory or your story or your narrative. I don't know. I try to figure out global events as they occur as much as I can. Yeah. What do you think about Russia and Ukraine? Oh, man, that's a war I've been studying uh, because of all the new fascinating things that they've been doing. The so. minefields are a huge part of this. Mm -hmm. Sometimes five mines per square meter I hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it. That's, and that's part of it. The thing that's been, that I've been watching is the fall of tank warfare. Tank warfare is dead. You really think so, oh, but they yeah. still keep throwing them in. We stopped. As a country, we don't produce M1 Abrams tanks anymore. We, we don't, don't produce even tanks. produce them? No. I didn't know that. Yep, we stopped because they're slow. They're easy to beat up. Because they, of the top turret. Mm -hmm. Now, the Russians made the mistake of auto-loading their tanks. So all of the ammunition is right there where it can be blown up easily and blows the turret off and kills everybody inside, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We didn't make that mistake. But our tanks are still just as vulnerable, you think, from above by drones? Is that it? Yeah. The tanks have always been a vulnerability. If the tanks are not count, if they're not uh, being escorted by infantry, they're always vulnerable. And it, what's particularly fascinating in Ukraine is the use of drones and their creative ways of using drones and drone warfare and training children to use drones Ooh. for drone warfare. So they're training kids. They're, they're using kids, too, for spotting, for intelligence, for all sorts of stuff. So that always brings up a question for me. Where do you draw the line on employing child soldiers? Apparently, our country says 18. Are 18-year-olds children? Yeah. My child is 18. Just Shit, turned mine, 18. Mine's going to be 18 in a, gosh, in a few days on the 23rd. My, no, my turn 18, 18 just a couple weeks ago, and it's a weird moment. It's a bigger deal for me than her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's for sure, because you realize, oh, man, I remember when I was 18. Yeah, but also my relationship with her changes mm -hmm. from I'm your father, you have to do this to I'm just another adult suggesting something to you. Literally, yeah. Totally changes. Mm-hmm. Totally does. Yeah, my oldest, he's turning 18, and that's... Yeah, he sent me, he's like, what are you going to get me for my birthday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I got to get him something. So, But, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that is crazy. But um, uh, in Ukraine, the drones is, the drones, the rocketry, and just the age-old question that a lot of Americans have had, what would happen if we got in a war with Russia? Who'd win? Oof, obviously, we know. Uh, Russia is the second best fighting force in Ukraine. I know it's ridiculous. Uh, they, it, it, I, <laughs> it, plus, there's so much corruption. They're literally, you know, what's crazy is I rolled jujitsu, which you should do. Everyone should do it. But I rolled jujitsu, and there's this Russian guy I rolled jujitsu with, and he was, and I said, "Why don't you join the military?" And he said, "I don't want to. I don't want to kill my own people." I'm like, whatever. And then I kept talking shit to him because we talk a lot of shit when we're rolling and then and then he said to me no the only people who join the military are drug addicts and alcoholics i'm like that's probably the case in russia literally yeah, yeah, yeah. that's probably literally what they're doing they're probably just taking homeless off the street 
They're giving them guns. They don't know what they're doing. No, they have they don't. no tactical cunning. They have no nothing. I mean, you see just like what a professional fighting force goes to Ukraine, trains them, and lets the Ukrainians fight. They're great. Yeah. So that which Russian... brings up some dark scenarios for me because like. Is Putin using Ukraine as a population sink to get rid of people that would have been protesting otherwise? Probably. That's a great idea, a population sink. I do. Yeah. I have heard that some anti-war protesters ended up in the front lines. Mm. Another thing that worries me is China and Taiwan. Mm, yeah. Xi Jinping has made it his, you know, one of his causes within the country to say that he will reunite Taiwan. And he did it with you, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong is no longer a free place. So is Taiwan next? Now, obviously, it's going to be way harder for China to take Taiwan than it is for Russia to U Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You can literally roll on into Ukraine on wheels. Taiwan is 100 miles away. Now, when the Ukraine war started, Ukraine was not prepared. Not at all prepared. Taiwan has been prepared since 1954 and they've been getting more and more prepared. They've got a serious air force. They've got, you know, they're doing a lot better than Ukraine was. So if China tries to take Taiwan, it's going to mean a lot more deaths. It's going to be, it's be a little harder, but that may not stop them. What if the economy really falls apart worse in China than it already has? I heard a statistic where, we remember how bad it was at the ha the peak of our housing crisis mm -hmm. in terms of economics, in terms of people being late on their mortgages, evictions, and um, remember Occupy Wall Street? Mm -hmm. The whole country was in an uproar because of that housing crisis. And however bad it was, China is at least three times as bad, proportionally but they have a different definition of late on their mortgage. Mm -hmm. For us, it's 30 days late. For them, it's 90 days late. What does that mean? That it's 10 times worse? It is incredibly bad. And somehow, they still have more structures than people. Supposedly, they overbuilt mm -hmm. some of these ghost cities yeah, and whatnot. Yeah, ghost cities, yeah. Enough to house 1.4 billion people that don't exist. And still, people are like, losing their homes. Like, what's going on there? So if the economy gets so bad, they have mass protests from a whole bunch of angry young men who incidentally also can't find wives yep. because of the gender yep. balance. Mm -hmm. The infocide. What are those young, angry, unemployed men going to do? Well, you got to find something for them to do. Maybe dying in Taiwan is what Xi Jinping will find for them to do. It's like 100,000 men that will never, like a lot. It's a significant yeah. portion that are, yeah, I mean, damn, you send a, a, an invasion force to the U.S. of 100,000, that could put a dent in us for sure. But, uh, yeah, oh, well, you know what? Um, the Uyghurs, I don't know if you've been following I have. That. And so that's an interesting thing that goes back to how... Involuntary organ donors. Yeah, involuntary organ... It, and workers and factories. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy how... But it doesn't surprise me that communist China does that at all. Yep. And that's how they handle terrorism. like Because it started with some Uyghurs were... It's crazy. I, I don't know if you've been following. Like, they have no rights. They... They'll get arrested for running. China's the largest surveillance state in the planet. And I yep. think about that, too, when people talk about AI and social credit scores. And I think, okay, somehow China... I don't believe it. I just... I don't buy Which it. Which part? I'm not buying the facial recognition. So facial recognition in China is so good that if you're in a major city and you jaywalk... By the time you finish crossing the street, your account will already be debited the fee. Mm -hmm. And in some places, they can put your face up on a jumbotron, basically, as shame, saying, you just jaywalked right here. Facial recognition is really good there. 
they have six over 600 million live camera feeds that we know of. My question as a data scientist is how many false positives are there? There might be a few, but I think, but it's dude, they all like people start to, to look us, the same. To us, they, I know. And, and, well, the yeah. older I get, the more I think a lot of people look the damn same. White people look the same. Like they all look the same in certain Patient ways. recognition is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Now, there is adversarial AI. Mm-hmm. AI is brittle. All facial recognition systems use certain, you know, network architectures in visual system, visual recognition systems. And they're awesome. They're great, but they are brittle and they can be broken with a couple of tiny tweaks here and there. And you may have seen little things go viral. Like this one guy on TikTok had a, a sweater with a weird pattern mm-hmm. that made the facial recognition system break. Mm-hmm. More and more stuff like that is going to come out. Mm-hmm. They are brittle, but they are very good. And China is going to use AI to control their people, which is why it's incumbent upon the rest of us to come up with tools to maximize freedom instead of control. Mm -hmm. And AI is just a tool. Mm -hmm. A good guy with an AI can stop a bad yeah, guy with an that. AI. That was a good one. I like that. I liked what you said during your TEDx speeches. You brought up some good points. And you brought up the fact that it's you brought up language and thinking of it in branching logic and I was before you came I was going over some uh, random forest models and just reading through random forests and brushing up on that but you're right it people well here's the thing let me digress I got so much to say on AI this is my thought on China with facial recognition. They must have some massive, massive server farm somewhere that they can hold all the faces of everybody. Tons, but and actually it's a small number. So think about this. Your face can be encoded into a single vector. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's 100 numbers, 300 numbers. It's not many. Mm-hmm. And you can store everybody's face in the entire world on one hard drive. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Because cause I was looking at the whole tokenization process and going through that. And um, yeah, yeah. So for people listening, if there is a picture or a... Well, let's, just, let's take it for natural language processing, right? So when... When people type in, uh, let's say you have a text uh, t- uh, of a Word document, and in this Word document, um, how is natural language processing going to process it? So what it does is it goes through tokenization. So what it does is it makes a vector length. So the vector is going to be a specific length, and you want your vector, your initial vector, that input vector to be the longest vector in the entire uh, series. So like, let's say if I have a poem, the longest sentence phrase, once it's padded, so they remove all the stop words and white spaces and common characters and it squishes it, basically left aligns it and then fills in the rest with zeros. So it's padding it all the way up to the end point. And the longest vector in there is going to be the the input size. Yeah. So you're getting into the details of it, but I like to describe it at an easier layman's level. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm a nerd. Think about um, being in a large room, and let's pretend our word vectors are going to be three dimensional. Okay. Then it's just an X and Y and a Z. And humans, we can visualize three dimensions. Mm-hmm. So you'll have your first word be you know, some point in space. And some, your next word will be some other point in that room. And by the time you finish the sentence, that sentence is just a path through the room, right? Okay. Then you can compare that path with other paths. 
and maybe you can figure out meaning and represent it spatially. Okay, yeah, so representing a word spatially on a on a 3D plane from yeah. a vector. Uh, yeah, maybe. I. Yeah, this is part of what we do. And when we first started making word vectors, a guy named Mikulov, I think, was one of the early pioneers in this. And he made vectors based on how often words showed up with other words. Mm -hmm. Like they say, you can tell a word by its friends. And he, I think, looked at four grams, so a window of four words, and just looked at every word and looked at how often it appeared with every other word. So mm -hmm. if you have, let's say you look at the top 50,000 words in English, that means you have a vector that's 50,000 long. Mm -hmm. And the number that goes in each slot in your vector is the proportion of times that word appeared with the word you're looking at. And he did this. And maybe he brought it down to fewer dimensions, like 300, using something called dimensionality reduction, but that's mm -hmm. not important. What is important is once he had these vectors, mm -hmm. he would do things like take the word for king, look up the vector, then take the word for man, look up the vector. Then you can start to do vector algebra on these things. Say, okay, the vector for king minus the vector for man plus the vector for woman, what's the closest word there? The word was queen. And then he realized something is represented here. There is something to this. King minus man plus woman equals queen. That makes sense. But then he also noticed that all our biases are in there. Doctor minus man plus woman equals nurse. Mm. So it's not a representative of truth, representation of truth. That's a representation of what we've written. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Interesting. So you're talking about using linear algebra with the epitomology of word, yep. kind of. That's what we've been doing. That's awesome. Since that's really cool. You know, 2000. I don't know, 15 or something. So where do you get the word corpus? All the internet. GPT, the most recent version, was trained on almost the whole internet. Mm -hmm. what, whatever they can get. This giant crawl. And if the average human is exposed to 20,000 words a day, like I said mm -hmm. that talk, it's over a million years of English that this thing is exposed to. Mm -hmm. And the way it's taught is it's shown a sentence, you blank out a random word and have it guess what you blinked out mm. and do it again and again and again. That's a really cool thing. I, I wonder too. And I wonder about how, and maybe you know more, you probably, you, you might be able to answer this question. This is something I've thought about because I don't have the answer to it. When people say like, I've, I've heard some claims with, chat gpt bart llama and other people that these language models can capture nuance and my thought is when i physically make one with nltk and tensorflow and i call the corpus of words it's just english i don't have like English variant Southern or anything. It's just English. So, and if you think about it down to the ASCII level, right, you have to convert it to the, you know, those, those translator apps. And so they're converting it to ASCII and then they're finding the foreign key or Unicode usually. Yeah. Uni yeah. And, um, if that has already a baseline, who is then going and reinventing an ASCII code? to try to see if a machine learning model can then get uh, these sort of nuance in language. So let's talk about an example. Okay. When you say nuance, what do you mean? Like give me an English sentence. I guess uh, some slang. Um, I wrapped an image in a tensor. Never. That was a new one for me. I heard that slang. So yeah, that would so, be like nuance. So, let 
when you process some sentence to know if you got it right or wrong, there has to be a task that you're measuring it against, right? Mm -hmm. um, for instance, one task is to read through the text of a review on Amazon and predict if it's positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And you could say, you know, five stars positive, one star negative, that kind of thing. And they got pretty good at this. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are times that <laughs> they couldn't get it because the nuance was too nuanced. Like one of the funny ones was the banana slicer. Mm -hmm. Somehow there's this banana slicer on Amazon you can get. You just, you know, it's a banana shaped, it's curved, it's yellow. And when you close it and open it up again, now your banana is all sliced because it has little mm -hmm. wires in it. Mm -hmm. Well, people just piled on, added tons of reviews. People who didn't even buy it. People were like, this is the meaning of life. It changed everything for me and my family. Like stupid, hilarious reviews mm -hmm. that were positive. They had positive text, many stars, but you as a human know that the banana slicer is not a significant invention. And so you understand that it's comedy, it's satire, it's mm -hmm. parody, but AI doesn't know any of that. And then there'd be people who would give it a bad review. They're like, my banana slicer came and it doesn't work because it's curved the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Hilarious stuff. And AI gets confused by this. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, you can see that there's a nuance that AI still hasn't gotten to yet. Mm -hmm. But you as a human know because you're a human that has experiences. Now, if... The signal is in the text only. and You don't need to be a human to experience it. Then AI can get the nuance. It just needs enough data mm -hmm. and enough time. Do you have any other examples you've come across? Well, I like you said, I actually I created a model that um, uh, reduces uh, movie reviews to a zero or a one using NLP. Good or bad? Yeah, good or bad. Um, where do you get the reviews IMDB IMDB uh, that's the one I did it with I mean now I could use it for like uh, YouTube mm -hmm. comments is where it's the biggest money maker but yeah you can run my code in the model and it should compile um, so I've done that for but but yeah you're right it but at the end of the day it's uh, how much level but the thing is, when I, I've listened to a lot of people make a lot of big claims about AI that they don't know, you know, um, people that know nothing about AI making these crazy claims. Um, like what? Let's talk about one. Well, 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 here's one. I had this guy because I'm a consultant and he came to me. And he basically charlatanized a bunch of people to get give him money, promising that he was going to make this model, this black box called a model, and basically make it like, I don't even want to say it, but it has to do with the logistics industry. Basically kind of like an Uber for, for trucking. stuff, for, for trucking? trucking, but... And this dude already had made a Google add-on, Google extend, a Google Chrome extension. He was selling to people, already selling it to people, and he didn't have the product. He had nothing, and he came to me, and he's like, "What can I do?" I'm like, "Do you own a server farm?" No. <laughs> I don't know how to help you. Because uh, it, they they think yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna make this thing that's basically Chat GPT or AI could do this or AI could do that or AI and I think as a man who actually physically makes it I'm like how the hell am I gonna make that like yeah. but but a lot of but there's a lot of models though that people discredit that are AI that people are machine learning but they don't think of it like market basket analysis yep market basket analysis is a powerful model that people take for granted and 
uh, the market basket analysis programs that you can run on your computer are much more powerful than Llama or ChatGPT. Yeah, let's remind people, let's remind the listener what market basket analysis is. Hmm. If you have a store that has like 3,000, 10,000 SKUs, what combinations of those SKUs are probable? Like if someone comes in and they pick up a six pack of beer, what else are they likely to pick up? Mm -hmm. And how can you guide them to put more in their basket? Mm -hmm. Which is huge. Yeah. It's huge. People overlook this. This is what made Amazon what they are, is that market basket analysis. And and the thing is that model's older. It's, you know, it's been around. Over, over 10 years. Yeah. yeah. In 2015, 2014, in 2014, I remember reading about some very mature algorithms that were already in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, market basket analysis. I, that's the one thing I've been, I, I really like. I enjoy doing Have that. you ever heard of set theory? I've heard of set theory. Refresh my memory okay. as to what context it's used in set theory is in the, basically studying collections of objects but the word set specifically means something different than collection but a set is a kind of like a list of objects and enumeration of those objects where each of them is either in the set or they're not mm -hmm. so the set of all numbers between one and ten or the set of all even numbers mm. or the set of all skews that a given store is selling well, a set is a, it could be a big number. If your store sells 100,000 items, maybe all across all of Walmart, you know, that's 100,000 things. Mm -hmm. But there's something called the power set, which is the set of all combinations of those things. And that's a much bigger number. So the set of all objects you can sell at Walmart, maybe it's 50,000 or something, but the set of all market baskets you could have at Walmart, that's enormously bigger. And computationally, it's very expensive to explore that space. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of other challenging spaces like Go, the game Go. Mm -hmm. You've heard about AI. Alpha Go. Yeah. yeah. And that was challenging because we can't attack it with brute force like you can with chess. With chess, you just play forward a whole bunch of moves, look at all possibilities, and choose the best. With Go, it's too many. Mm -hmm. Our best supercomputers, yeah, our best compu supercomputers mm -hmm. don't have enough capacity. So instead, we have to model a style of play. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Or figure so modeling a style of play with AlphaGo. Yeah. Yeah. It, and that's another thing. So how how many models? What do you think was the architecture of these so models? So I think it has two parts. Okay. There's the style of play and some playing forward. So they're playing forward in time. If you think about a board state as a point in a network. Mm -hmm. in a tree like this is where we are now now if you make this move here we go down this branch of the tree and this move here we go down this branch of the tree and i think the board is something like what is it 20 by 20 grid or something mm -hmm. i forget what it is but it's a big number so if it's 20 by 20 if it happens to be that then there'd be 400 places on there at the beginning of the game, maybe you go in the middle, but then you got almost 400 more places you can go. That's a branching factor of 400. That means your tree has, you know, 400 next move options. And then almost 400 for the next one. Almost that for the next one. Exponentially, that's a massive number. So you can't look at the whole tree. Then the game becomes... How do you prune the tree and only look at the important parts? That's where the style comes in. So the style engine tells you which parts are interesting. It is like an attention system. What possibilities should I pay attention to? And then you only look at a little bit of the tree, but you still do play forward. 
So the old way we play chess where you look forward a whole bunch of moves with the computer, we're still doing that. In fact, the, the best Go program that was playing humans, AlphaGo, if you only use the style part and don't use the look ahead, it can't beat the best humans. Mm. It has, I don't remember the Elon number, but it's a third of what true AlphaGo is, which combines both. Which reminds me of the two parts of AI, what they call type one and type two, or what the economist Daniel Kahneman called system one and system two. Where system one is your instinct. It's very quick. It doesn't give you an exact answer. Like if you're in a scary situation or you're feeling really creeped out by someone, it's your type one system. It's your instinct. Mm -hmm. It's your feelings. Mm -hmm. The feeling it gives you is the answer. Your type one system will never tell you the answer to a math problem or the capital of a state. That's type two. Type two is more about logic and specific answers and algorithms. Mm -hmm. So you got type one and type two. Same thing in AI. Neural networks and symbolics. And this dichotomy began in the 50s. Marvin Minsky on one side said, everything has got to be like formal logic and symbolics and symbols and algorithms. And Frank Rosenblatt, who made the first neural network in 1958, he was like, no, it's got to be like a brain. A whole bunch of little math programs that in aggregate act like a brain. Okay. So it seems like you're trying to describe, you're describing what's going on in the Transformers with ghost attention. So Transformers are type one, okay. purely. All right. So Transformers type one and there's the encoder and the decoder. And in my mind, I'm thinking like any generative adversarial network, one is battling the other. In this case, there isn't that. Okay, there's Encoders no... and decoders don't battle each other. Okay. They actually work together. Okay. Encoders work to take something very complex, a whole passage of text. It could even be up to like 25,000 words and represent that in a bunch of matrices. Mm -hmm. So transformers are built around the concept of attention that I talk about in that talk. Attention is just like how much of a signal words get from other signals. Mm -hmm. But when we do it in practice, it's a whole lot more complicated. Yeah. You have these three matrices, the query, the key, and the value matrix inside every head of attention. So a head of attention is just a thing that looks at the world a certain way or looks mm -hmm. at the text a certain way. So let's say you have a, you know, like 20 heads in your first layer. They're going to look at the text a certain way, grind it up and spit it out in new vectors. And then you do that again and again and again. Maybe you've got like 10 of these or 20 of these. And then at the end, you have a whole bunch of matrices that have ground up the signal, churned through it in a number of ways. There's unfathomable amount of calculations. And then those matrices supposedly represent everything you need to know about the text. Then the decoders can use that for some task, such as translation. Mm, got you. Got you. Got you. All right. Yeah, that's what makes sense. All right. So then are you able to go into the... the um, Generative adversarial networks. So, gen yep, but that's different. Yeah, it's it different is thing. different. Yeah. And this is what yeah. I'm getting conflated. Yeah, so um, imagery is a great way people have gone through those. That's how this person does not exist was made. Have you seen that website? No. This person does not exist, and it will show you a photorealistic, it looks like a picture of a person, mm -hmm. some random person. Maybe they were wearing glasses, maybe they're not, maybe they're old, young, any race. Just shows you a beautiful picture of a person. And it's not a real person. It was made by a general adversarial network where they had a whole bunch of photos of real people and they had a generator. 
Now on day one, the generator just made noise. And the discriminator wasn't very good. But the discriminator started to get good at separating the generated noise from real images. Then the generator had to get better. So it could trick the discriminator. So it started to make things that were a little bit more face-like. Then the discriminator had to get better because now the generated images were a little bit more like faces. And then once it got better, the, the generator had to get better tricking it. And that cat and mouse game made them both better. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For, and, and that's on a convolutional neural network as well. It, sometimes it is involved, but GANs, general adversarial networks, don't need convolutional neural nets. Okay. GANs in general are just the strategy of using a cat and mouse game to make two things better at the same time. The the liar and the thing that's determining who lies. Yeah, and that's something I think about wholly, like in terms of the Turing test, you know. Um, and, and kind of, this is what, and, and I've thought about this on wholesale. Like, if the Turing test, there, I believe there's certain chatbots that are passing the Turing oh, test because I believe if you, you passed it already, totally. Because yeah. here's the real Turing test. Turing knew that imagery was so far away he couldn't even imagine it. So it's just about text. And he imagined a small group of judges sitting in one room, mm -hmm. submitting questions by text to some other room. I'm going to vape my marijuana. Just don't give me a second hand. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to. There we go. Yeah, I still need to be able to classify. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're a good boy. You don't do nothing bad. No, just alcohol. And he's been drinking, so you can't hold him liable for things. <laughs> exactly. So you have this group of judges, human judges, maybe four or five. You have a human in one room and a computer in another room. The judges submit a certain number of text questions. I don't remember what it was, maybe 50 the computer and the human provide 50 answers then the voters the judges have to vote if more than half of them are confused or they get the wrong answer it passes the turing test so obviously we need something beyond that now the movie ex machina had a really good idea for the next step you saw it right no, I haven't seen it, but okay. I've heard about Ex Machina. So right. good. So what, what is, what's their answer? His idea for something beyond the Turing test is you have an AI that you know is an AI. Can you convince a human that it has a mind, mm. a true intelligence, a soul, even though you know it's man-made? That's good. That's a good one. That's a better one. It's a harder test. Yeah, that is. That is. You know, um, I don't know if you've, well, I, I get consumed with podcasts in this space and I listen to things and I, and I'm hearing, uh, like what is consciousness? Yeah. And I think about, does a computer have consciousness? I say yes. And because I'm taking Rene Descartes definition, which is, I think I'm thinking, therefore I am, I am conscious. And if my computer's thinking, it's conscious. Is it sentient? No. But then again, you brought up another thing. What is imagination? Like, and, and what imagination is an idea space where we can take things and abstract them. We can take reality and abstract it in this space. We could leave it there. We can move it into the real world if we wanted. But the models that have, that are good are the ones that create novel things because what's novel is interesting but what's interesting isn't always novel okay you've touched on so many things i gotta stop you for a okay. minute so we can get to all yeah, the yeah yeah edgar dykstra said can a submarine swim what do you think uh in a crude definition i don't 
I think so, sure. He said that question is equivalent to, can a computer think? Mm, that's a good point. From an outside perspective, it seems to get from place A to place B. It's doing the output of what we tend to output when we quote unquote think. Mm -hmm. I do believe there's a big difference. And consciousness is the core of that difference. Consciousness is something that is so hard to study. It's a little bit like asking a fish what water is. It's everywhere. We don't notice it. How could we? It's the stuff we're made of. Like when I think about what I am as a person, I'm not just the matter. Every seven years or so, every molecule in my body, almost all of them will be replaced, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, zinc atoms, iron I was made of seven years ago, I'm not that stuff. That stuff flaked off or became my poop. Mm -hmm. So what am I? I'm a pattern through time. That pattern was maintained by whatever atoms happen to still be in my body. You watch Lex Friedman, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Love him. That's why I'm, I'm digging your black with the black. I think all, yeah. I, I started him. doing that before I ever watched Lex Friedman. Sweet. Yosha Bach was on a couple times. And I enjoy those conversations. And one night, I got to have dinner with Yosha Bach and Ben Gertzel at the same time and a few other people. And I had to study just to figure out and learn just some of the comments they dropped during dinner. Brilliant, brilliant people. But there was one question that Lex Friedman asked Yosha Bach that he didn't have a good answer for. And I love how Lex gets to the core of the issue. They're talking about computers and Turing machines, which are just simplified mathematical versions of a machine. Mm -hmm. And Yosha is saying that humans are just Turing machines. And Lex Friedman said, does it suffer? That's the core issue. Mm. If a computer cannot suffer, then it's not conscious. If it can, then now we have to preserve its rights. Google famously fired a guy for saying that their LLM was conscious. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think that was great marketing. Mm -hmm. If yeah. I were Google and I wanted the world to think we have something really special, I would line up some employee and say, hey, you release to the media that it's conscious and they will fire you very publicly. And cause their huge brouhaha. Oh no, Google has a conscious AI and they're trying to hide it. Mm -hmm. I believe it's not conscious. Here's why. I understand the general math that goes into transformers. That model is a transformer. If you had enough time and people, you could do that math with pencil on graph paper. You would get the same answer. Is pencil and paper conscious? I don't think so. And if you go to a, a piece of graph paper and say this little square holds the pleasure and this holds the pain and you make the pain square have a high number, is it suffering? No. Something entirely different is going on. Something that has to be, to be understood, must be described in terms of scientific primitives. There are a lot of great theories out there that talk about consciousness. Consciousness is so hard to study. We have to first, little by little, creep our way in by making true statements about it and building on it. We've known for forever that if you get your arm cut off, you don't lose any of your consciousness. It's not in your arm. It's also not in your leg. It's not in your liver. It's not in your ears. It's in the brain. Now, people do talk about emotions coming from parts of the, our body. And there are neurons throughout the body that could affect the emotional state. But we've seen that the, the brain really is the center of the consciousness. Where in the brain? It's hard to know. Anil Seth, a 
great researcher in this space. And you're a neuroscientist too. No, I studied and I dabble in it, but I'm not an official neuroscientist. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You, you studied it, yes. You went to school for it. I took a few courses okay. on it. Okay, gotcha. Um, also, my dad's a neurologist and I grew up hearing everything he had oh, to yeah. say. But Anil Seth said that through most of the brain, if you get a bullet going through that part of the brain, you will still be conscious, you'll still be alive. Mm -hmm. But there's one part near the brain stem mm -hmm. that just lights out. Yep. Yep. So for some reason, that part of the brain is more essential. Maybe it's a collection point. I don't know. Another thing I find very promising as a field of study is studying consciousness based on what turns it off or affects it. And Stuart Hemeroff and Sir Roger Penrose, winner of the Physics Nobel Prize and hero of mine, he was also an advisor um, on Stephen Hawking's PhD thesis. Roger Penrose believes that whatever is going on with consciousness, it's beyond computation. Computation is literally the set of things that can be effectively performed by a Turing machine. A Turing machine is, again, that simple machine that has ones and zeros and an infinite tape and just goes along racing or writing symbols. And every computer program you've ever used in your life is effectively a Turing machine of a different type. Roger Penrose says, no, the human brain is doing hyper computation, something beyond computation. And he describes it very mathematically. And he gives great examples like he has these things called polyominoes. So it's like a dom domino has two, two squares. A polyomino has more squares, maybe three, maybe 20. And these squares are in some consistent shape. Now, sometimes you'll get just the right polyomino and you put a bunch together and it can tile the whole plane, meaning you could make them go on forever without any gaps. Now, is it going to repeat itself or not? Now, if it's just a simple square, of course, it's going to repeat itself, repeats itself everywhere. <coughs> but Penrose was a leader in finding polyominoes that tile the plane in a way that does not repeat itself. Hmm. So overall, you can't lift the whole thing up and drop it back down and make it match. The, he's also proven that a computer, meaning a Turing machine, cannot determine if polyominoes tile the plane a periodically like that. So here is a clear example, something that humans can do and a computer cannot, and we prove that it cannot. Now, Yosha Bach complains about this and says that, you know, he states something, things wrong or something, but I'm still on the side of Penrose that there are things that humans can do that a computer cannot. And here's what I think consciousness is. I believe that there is quantum effects enabling consciousness. I think that entanglement is a big part of it. People used to say that entanglement couldn't occur at body temperatures. But we now know that entanglement between two parts of a protein in the back of the eye of a bird helps them determine the differential in magnetic field strength of the Earth's magnetic field so they know to fly north or south. They can see magnetic field changes literally in their eye. And they use entanglement to do that. So entanglement can occur at body temperatures. That's fascinating. So we're talking about quantum entanglement. Yes. Correct. Where two atoms like in the theory is or states, like... states, the two end of a protein. Yeah, yeah. And which is cool. So in, in theory, you could send messages instantly to Jupiter if you had a deep That's quantum. a separate topic. Okay. We will get there. All right. I'll do that next. But we're talking either end of a protein. That's okay. a very, very short distance and within a very short amount of time. So Roger Penrose thinks that states could be entangled even inches or a couple feet in the brain. 
which I don't know if I believe that. That's a huge claim, but I can totally get that within a neuron. You could have entanglement, and especially along the microtubules that he always talks about. There are these type A microtubules, small structures made of ribulin that are hexagonal and very consistent and very symmetric. And quantum states are more stable when you have situations like that. There are also these other hexagonal molecules that fit right on the sides that seem to be maybe related to memory, short-term memory. If that kind of thing is a part of our consciousness, I think it's possible that our consciousness could be an aggregate of these entanglements, entangled quantum states, that when you wake up in the morning, they start to re-entangle. Now, something like qualia, mm -hmm. qualia is this concept of mm -hmm. something seems red mm -hmm. or seems blue or feels good or feels bad mm -hmm. or sounds like the letter T or F or mm -hmm. G. All those qualia are just certain locations in the brain. If something feels like someone's, that you have the quality of having your index finger touched, mm -hmm. it's because of where the neurons in the brain that get that signal are. All of the sections of our brain, we can actually look at them closely and you'll see columns. Like, take, take the cortex of the brain, fold it out, it'd approximately be a foot by foot and an inch thick. And maybe thousand or thousands of these relatively divisible columns. The cortical column is just a bunch of neurons that is more connected to itself than the area around it. And there's about six layers. And they're kind of the same hardware everywhere. What makes the hearing part do hearing and the vision part do vision? Mostly because of what it's connected to. The vision part does vision because it's connected to the eyes. The hearing part does hearing because it's connected to the ears. The part that does the feeling from my fingers does that because it's connected to the nerves coming from my fingers. So your qualia, something feels like something because of what it's connected to. Now, what is the thing that's doing the feeling? What is the thing that's doing the observing? or the feeling of the pain or the joy. That thing is this meta thing, the plurality of entangled quantum states that exists on a network of neurons while you're awake. When you start to go to sleep, it starts to disband. Now it comes back again in a different way when you're dreaming. But it is a, I believe, a plurality of quantum entangled states. And when something means something to you, that means it triggers or excites a neuron in a certain place. And that place, for you, internally, is just different. Red is just different from blue, different from green, different from a sound, different from feeling something with my finger different from someone saying my name. They're just different. How many different ideas are you able to have? Maybe 20 billion. I mean, some of your neurons can encode an idea. Some can. I mean, you're going to need usually a cluster of neurons for one idea. Because if one of them dies, you still want to have that idea possible in your head. But that's what I believe consciousness is. Now you have this plurality of entangled quantum states. Whatever that thing is, it can suffer. It can feel joy. What does it mean to suffer? I find interesting the work on organoids. Okay. Some scientists have taken some human skin cells use the Yamanaka factors to convert them into pluripotent cells, then convert those into neurons. And they put them on a substrate 
where they can send in and read electric signals. Then they teach those neurons to play Pong. Oh, no shit. That's awesome. And then these human neurons are literally playing Pong. What is that like for them? Is it a waking nightmare? Do they know it's Pong? Or are they feeling joy? Is it some neurons that are like, yay, we can play video games forever? What's going on? What is it like to be those neurons? I don't know if they have consciousness. Because, you know, our cortex up here mm -hmm. may have a part that's doing something even when, you know, the part of the brainstem got shot out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're conscious, but it's the closest thing I think we can look at and study and, in a sense, manufacture. Now, the scary thing is what they do to train it. I mean, when you train something to play a game, you got to give it punishments and rewards. Mm -hmm. One of the kind of punishments they've tried is the silent treatment. When it does something wrong, give it the silent treatment for a second. Then go back to playing the game. And it gets better. It doesn't like the silent treatment. The other thing is chaos. When it gets the wrong answer, send in a bunch of random loud signals. It doesn't like that either. So organoids is probably a field of research that will grow, meaning eventually you'll have larger and larger clusters of these organoids. And you may someday be in a large building and the HVAC is all controlled by human brain cells. That's the kind of thing I see happening. The technology is getting close. We could get there. It's not that hard. It is troubling, though, because I know human brain cells can have consciousness. Will those? I don't know. Now, your other question about entanglement, sending a message to Jupiter. Well, scientists have proved that it's impossible to send oh, okay. information faster than the speed of light. They've proven it. You can't send it using that entanglement. Okay. However, I think there's a way around it. All right. And there's a guy named Rick Steenblick who patented something for the Ansible Corporation. He was he started a company called Ansible Incorporated. And he patented it in nineteen ninety five, I think. And I thought it was so interesting. I went down and talked with him. And he said that he had spent $600,000 and had the world's expert on parametric down conversion crystals. These are important because they create entangled particles. You take a single laser and you send it into a parametric down conversion crystal and then you get two entangled photons for every one photon you sent in. Every two photons, these two photons have half the energy and they go off in opposite directions and they are entangled then what you can do supposedly is you look at one quantum observable on one of them and the other the qu the conjugate quantum observable will become affected and you will collapse the state on the other side merely by measuring on the first side and he believed that he could set up a communication system this way and they really thought it was going to work Spent $600,000, had the world expert, and they could not make it work. Part of me believes it will work. We just need to have better equipment. But the bulk of physicists who are experts in this field say it's impossible, and they've proven it's impossible. So, meh, I still believe. I believe it will be possible. We'll see. So, wow. Um, see, that I, I'm glad you, you're here to tell me this because, I mean, there's so much to know about the world of quantum physics and whatnot. And, and I spend so much of my time just trying to get code to compile. <laughs> like, why don't you work? But um, it, which brings up another point. How, well, okay. You brought up the neural synaptic hardware, and that's something I've been reading into for some of the places I follow. That I think that will be a thing somehow. 
Uh, yep. Well, what does it take to keep or, organic matter alive, though? That's Oh, we're getting better at it. Yeah. And one of the ways we got better at it was cancer research. Mm. Have you ever heard of this woman? Her name was Henrietta something. Um, she was perhaps, they say, I think an unwitting donor to an experiment. They're trying to cure cancer, mm -hmm. and they took a biopsy of her cancer. And it's very hard to keep human cells alive outside of the body. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, her cancer was special, and they were able to keep those cells alive and multiply them. And now there are like thousands of pounds of her body tissue alive in laboratories all over the world. Wow. Yeah. In fact, they made a movie about her, and Oprah Winfrey played her. Yeah. She's dead now. She's been dead for years, but her body lives on through these cells. And these are some of the most important cells for cancer research in history. Wow. I yeah. did not know that. Yeah. That is impressive. Every yeah. day, there's just some new thing that you don't even realize. I think this is from the 80s. And I'm just now yeah. learning. Wow. Yeah. So this cancer preserved the cells outside yeah. of the body and allowed the human cells to multiply while still maintaining its own cancer. Yeah. And it's just cancer. No normal yeah. cells, just okay, cancer just cells. The and But they were good at surviving, and that mm. enabled us to study what it takes to keep human cells alive outside the body. Mm. So we're better at it now, partly because of that. For some reason, I think her name was Henrietta Lee, something like that. But she gave a lot to us, and she didn't get credit. Now we're trying to give credit to her. Well, now I know. And yeah. now hopefully people listen to this will know Henrietta Lee. I think that's her name. Don't quote me on that. Here's a question I, I think. I, I hear a lot of, and I'm glad that you're not an AI doomsdayer. Because no, there's a lot. They're, they're the ones I call charlatans. The, the, the ones out there preaching fear, fearing up people. Um I think there's more of a chance of dying in a car wreck than having AI kill you. And AI has only done good things so far. Um, my question is for people, how much more of your consciousness are you willing to give up to a machine? How much more oh, are you none. thinking? <coughs> so I'm willing to give up thinking, but not consciousness. Yeah, thinking. Here's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Every time I go to the store, I have to think about, oh, what do I want to get? What's the price of that? Is that product better? I'd rather not do any of that thinking. I'd rather have me. I'd rather open up my fridge and it's magically full of things that are good enough. Mm -hmm. Let the AI do that. Sure. There are so many tasks in life like that. Like when I do laundry, I'm like, am I going to separate the darks from the lights this week? I don't need to think about that. It's not making my life better. When I look out the yard, was it mowed correctly? At what point of the year are we going to prune the trees? I don't want to think about that. I'd rather let an AI do all that. Mm -hmm. And everything I do spend my thinking on in a perfect future, it would be things that I choose to spend mm -hmm. my thinking on, not that I have to. There's so much that we have to do to stay alive, even in our affluenza world that we mm -hmm. live in. I mean, I'm grateful we don't have to do things like walk two miles and there and back to get water. We mm -hmm. don't have to do that. We're doing so much better than the pharaohs of Egypt, than the emperor of Rome. Mm -hmm. We have better quality water than he had. We had, we just have so much and it's great and we need to keep this up. Um, but I don't fear giving up those mundane decisions to AI. Do mm -hmm. you? No. No, um, that's just the question I ask. And, and, and I, I think though, when somebody is in a self-driving car, they are then giving up their consciousness if they choose not to focus on the road and they're on their phone texting. Um, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. That's, that's not a part. I, I, I'm yeah. all about that. Yeah, I just want to get there. Mm -hmm. The car I, happens to be how I'm getting there. If you had a portal I could walk through in the wall, like a Stargate, mm -hmm. I'd do that instead. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I would. I would love to see that with the day of self-driving cars. I would, because I would. I, 
I have trips I, I need to go on and those are like hours long. I'd rather like do a podcast during it or yeah. study or do something that's productive. Yeah. And I'm pretty confident we'll get there, but we won't know we're there. Mm. We'll be like, we'll be in a place where AI has maybe 10 times fewer accidents than humans and we still won't trust it. Mm -hmm. It'll take it to get like 20 to one ratio. And eventually insurance companies will be the one to push us to do it. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Oh, you're a human and you want to drive with your own hands on the wheel. Oh, you got to pay this much insurance. But if the AI is driving, then your insurance goes down to this mm -hmm. and maybe they'll do it mile by mile. Like you can drive some, you can let the AI drive some, but you know that whenever your human hands are on the wheel, you're paying four times as much insurance. If you can do it. I think that's the kind of thing that'll eventually change behaviors. Yeah. I want to see the day where you could just say to your car, Hey car, go pick up the kids from school. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder where that's going to go. Like you can't do that. That's unethical or whatever. No. Well, maybe if it's not, maybe if the car is so reliable, why is that a bad thing? It's definitely the ethical argument is going to be, is it ethical for humans to drive? Mm. That's going to be the problem. Yeah. And I'm still going to want to drive because I love being a human mm -hmm. and being free. Oh yeah. And part of why I'm a Ron Swanson fan. Mm hmm. Don't try to control us, Mr. Government. Yeah, yeah. And that's something, too, that I've noticed people r rally around to make these, these AI ethics committees. And they got all these committees of people who just, they don't even know how to make it. They no. couldn't tell you what a machine learning, they couldn't name one machine learning model, but they just talk about it like it's the thing it's the other well i do believe we need to talk about it and figure it out because mm -hmm. for the first time in history we're applying the trolley problem you heard about the trolley problem no right? okay there is a trolley it's on a train track and it's headed toward a dividing like a switch point point. Uh -huh. and you're at the switch controls mm -hmm. you can divert it to the left or the right oh and the left's your friend on the well, on the left, where it's headed right now, uh -huh. it's headed toward the left, and it's going to kill five people. Oh, yeah. And you don't know them. You don't even remember their names. On the right track is your son. Mm. If you don't throw the switch, are you a murderer? Are you murdering five people to save your son? Or if you don't do anything, you're like, hey, I didn't set that cart in motion. It's not my fault. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Ooh, ooh, I would think that. Um, all right, so the trolley problem. I'm, I'm trying to think how it relates back. Here's how it relates back. If you're the programmer okay. for Tesla self-driving and you're preparing for a situation where the Tesla sees a pedestrian in the street mm. and it knows okay i can maneuver to not hit that pedestrian but there's other pedestrians mm -hmm. and there's nowhere to go that doesn't involve killing a pedestrian so now the programmer some random person maybe in silicon valley or texas has to decide who dies mm. what do they choose do you make that choice based on the person's age to sit you maybe favor the lives of young people. Do you make that choice? Because the it probably will be available. The computer could perceive things about the people if we chose to look. Or do we just make it random? Say, I'm just gonna choose a random person to hit them instead. What do we do? Ooh. Do we do nothing and just say, hey, what Tesla decide? We'll let some twenty five year old programmer make you know, hold the fate of future people in their hands or do we as a government make a decision for them or do you let the consumer make a decision maybe you wouldn't you get your new tesla there's a slider it goes from you know protect me to protect pedestrians like maybe there's a situation where to save the pedestrian's life you'd have to drive the tesla into a brick wall and kill yourself Ooh, and that's not keeping the consumer safe no 
Maybe the consumer, though, you want to give them the option to be altruistic. Mm -hmm. Man, that's tough. I know what I would do. I would just be biased because I'm a human. Yeah. And I would save my son. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But. I would save my daughter over everybody. Yeah. Um, And a lot of people feel that way. mm Mm-hmm. Uh, but what you're talking about bias in the system and there is like i don't know if you heard of the uh the racist soap dispenser there was a soap. no yeah it's good so they train this they they train this uh neural net on a bunch of hands but they only use white people <laughs> Yo, so it didn't yeah. dispense soap for anybody who wasn't white yeah, yeah. oh that's terrible mm-hmm. that's so terrible. so that's that's yeah. a, a case in point of overfitting the data yeah with you know, another funny case in point was that some cities disallowed their police from using facial recognition. Oh, yeah. The New York City, that was just on the news. They disallowed the state of New York doesn't allow uh, facial recognition in public schools. So some com- some cities don't let their police department do it because the facial recognition systems are more accurate for white males than anybody else. Mm. Now. I wonder if there's a secret subtext to that where the white males are like, oh, no, we're the only ones they're going to catch. Oh, well, that could be. And then they're like, yeah, we'll we'll pretend it's a a racist thing and then we'll disallow it so we can keep getting away with our crimes. Mm -hmm. You know, I've thought about this, too, Uh, like um, in the world of data. So a lot of people, okay, I guess when it comes to uh, facial recognition, uh, people like me are going to sit and argue the accuracy of the model and the false positives, mostly. Like, I think that's what statisticians kind of do is they just sit and argue how the study was wrong and how things were, like, gathered wrong. Um. What I'm finding is a lot of people, a lot of Americans feel that they're more surveilled than they really are. And in some cases, that's true because we gave up a lot of privacy the day you got a cell phone, especially now, because people don't realize we don't live in the age of, we don't live in the digital age. We live in the age of API. And like you can pull somebody's like Google geolocation API. It's creepy. And they even give you the script in Python too. If you want to like pull stuff and pull API on people. And for five bucks a month, you can find out if they're speeding. Anybody? Yeah. If you have their phone number. Yeah. If you just type in their phone number and then if they had Google at all or google Ma- so and that's why that's why google like what they say like don't be fucking evil that was their that was their their thing don't, don't be, be evil. evil yeah and but people don't realize we live in the age of api but they also i think they think that we have more surveillance than what we really do be, just because they can pull the data on us doesn't mean it's clean and doesn't mean that they could do it all the time for everybody yeah and, and where I mean, are they going to keep it? How long are they keeping the data? Well, they keep it in Utah. There's a massive center out there. Mm-hmm. The question is, do they have time to care about you personally? Yeah. Do they have time to care about you? And I've thought yeah. about this. Like, let's say the FBI wanted you. If they, they want wanted, you, they'll get you. Yeah, they'll get you, right? Yeah. Like, let's say, but let's say, like, the FBI, and I'm sure I'm there's somebody out there who's like, no, Michael, you're wrong. It works like this. But if I was some... Just being a data miner, if and I worked for an agency, or no, let's say I worked for Google, right? And somebody, and I was like the head manager of analytics at Google, and somebody said, "Hey, the FBI wants this on this." I'm like, "They want everything you can get on this guy." I'm like, okay, what? Like, what does that mean? Yeah. What is specifically everything? Am I going to get it all to you and you're going to say, we already knew this? Or what do you want me to do with all this? One of those two things. So, and then he has to figure it out. He has to find out what database you're on. They have to be able to pull the data. They got to hope it's there. 
They got to hope that, and they may have to pull it from several different databases just to compile the data on you. And then they have to engineer the features yeah, just to run anything. And none of it's like, I don't know. I think people have a bigger idea of Big Brother, some eye in the sky, than what there really is. But they do believe that because they experience things like that. Yeah, and your cell phone, not only does Google know where you are, you have a MAC address on the Wi-Fi card. And it's sending out to the world, I'm this. So every house you go past, every store you go past, even if you don't connect to their Wi-Fi, your MAC address was screamed out to the world. Foursquare, the company, mm -hmm. which used to have a nice app for users, now all they do is track customers and movements and things like that data. And Foursquare knows not only your GPS location, but like which floor of a building you're on. Mm. Yeah. And they sell that about you. Even if you don't have any Foursquare app, if any of the apps that you have are customers of Foursquare mm -hmm. or connected with Foursquare in any way, maybe selling data for, to Foursquare, then they know. Yeah, it's creepy. They, they got it. Um, and I explain this to my family and they're like, what about our privacy? And what? Well, I tell them like, yeah. look, first off, your purchasing behavior is not private at all. Like nobody in the grocery store should turn a blind eye to you purchasing your groceries you know you're in public it's gonna be your purchasing behavior is totally not private and what and then i'm looking at chat gpt because i'm looking for more places to try to find data you know and i'm like hey where can i buy data where where what are good data marts that sell really good accurate data and like experian equifax i'm like oh no shit they're selling all of your stuff so if you want to get someone's financials you go there so it and and that brings up a whole nother thing to cybersecurity too. Like Yeah, maybe we should save that for next time. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We have been running for two thirty nine, so two hours thirty nine minutes. So we can keep talking if you want, but if, let's save it for next time. All right, we'll save it for next time. Okay, I bet. So where can people find you? Grandmorehead.com. And of course, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Uh, what else? What other? Pangeon.com. Pangeon.com. And sometimes they go on podcasts. Yep. Cool. But cool. I just wrote a new book called The Shape of Thought. The Shape of Thought. Where and they, it's on Amazon. On Amazon. Do they print as, as. Paperback. Yeah. So is it one of those where you send them the thing and they print it as somebody buys it? Yeah. Whenever yeah, someone buys what, it, they print it up. That's a cool model. Yeah, cool. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. That was Graham Moorhead. Be sure to like, subscribe, and smash that bell for more data-driven updates. Bye.